everybody, this is Grimmy, and this is an audiobook of my ongoing series, My Father's Warmth, which is a My Hero Academia Todoroki AU. Don't expect any good voice acting from this, I'm not a voice actor, so when you're listening to this audiobook, think of more like your mum telling you a bedtime story. Um, yeah, I will not, I will not be attempting to replicate people's voices, don't expect that from me, please. <laughs> please. <laughs> so, but yeah, just... Bare minimum, b below, below, below average expectations from me, please. My Father's Warmth is a happy Todoroki AU uh, fan fiction where, it, where it's a retelling of the Todoroki family story if Enji Todoroki was never traumatized and got the guidance and support he needed growing up. Chapter 1. Glimmer. Many thoughts went through his mind as he felt the crushing weight of rubble on his back, suffocating in the dust and pain. They were not of the schoolgirl he had just tried to save, who was unconscious beside him nor of the numbing pain in his left arm, nor even of the fear for his own life. Enji was all he thought of. Enji, his thirteen-year-old son. Enji, who he hadn't had the time to say goodbye to this morning because he had to leave early for work. Enji, who, if he died, would be alone. As Haruo Todoroki laid helpless and on the brink of dying under the ruins of the school he worked at, having been attacked by a villain, all he could think of was of his son Enji and how he hadn't done enough for him, hadn't been present enough, had let his young son seen his own father struggle and stress for years, how he must have made him feel like a burden, how he must have blamed himself for his mother leaving before he could even remember her, and how, in all this time, Haruo hadn't once reassured him it wasn't his fault. Todoroki men struggle expressing themselves, and even when they do, it comes out wrong. Haruo had never found the confidence to have a conversation with Enji about everything, had told himself he would, but whenever he tried, he backed out. Maybe it was cowardice, or nervousness, or simply embarrassment at not being a better man, but Haruo could never find it in himself to speak honestly to his only child. He couldn't die here. If he did, Enji would have no one. No closure, no support, no knowledge of just how much his father genuinely loved him. He really hadn't ever said how much he loved him, did he? Too busy with his own work and typical adult struggles, Haruo had never fully noticed just how much Enji had been doing for him, how he did the chores around their small apartment, how he knew how to look after both of them despite being barely a teen, how he never gave Haruo a reason to worry about him. But now, as Haruo could feel his lungs filling with dust and his vision blurring, air becoming hard to breathe, Haruo realised just how alone Enji was. He never spoke of friends, he had no siblings, no mother, and all he did was work hard and be efficient. Just like how Haro did every single day. They had missed out on so much. Haro never had the time to take Enji on outings. Hadn't taken him to the park or out to eat since he was barely a toddler. He couldn't remember ever attending a parent-teacher conference, being a teacher himself. He'd just be sent the details by email from his colleagues. When was the last time he took Enji to school personally? When was the last time he properly hugged his son? When was the last time he had fully looked at him? His vision darkened. No, 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 he couldn't die here. Not like this. Not we had so much he needed to make up for. Not now that Angie had just started middle school. No. Over here, there's two more! A voice cried as light suddenly engulfed and blinded him. Haruo winced and coughed at the fresh air, heaving against the earth as hands pulled and grabbed at him. The, the girl he wheezed out, only just remembering the ten-year-old schoolgirl he had tried to protect. A student from his class he had been teaching in the gymnasium when a villain attacked out of nowhere. Unfortunately, a common happening these days, with the crime rate being so high. We've got her, she's breathing, one voice reassured, letting the tall Haruo lean on them as they carried him out of the rubble. Just concentrate on yourself, you're going to be alright. That's how he found himself sitting on an ambulance stretcher, Doors of the said ambulance opened behind him as first responders and medical aid ran around the destroyed school grounds, pulling survivors and the dead alike from the rubble. Somewhere in the distance, he saw the girl he had tried to protect sobbing into her parents' arms. He had been told she was fine. Scratched, bruised, shaken and traumatised, but physically, she'd recover. Haro had been the one to take the brunt of the damage his back a cascade of cuts and bruises, his left arm was broken in a sloppy sling, and they'd need to do checks on his spine and ribs once they got him to the hospital. But he could sit, and he was stable, and he was breathing. Father! A familiar voice cried out. 
Snapping his head up, he saw Enji running at full sprint towards him, having ducked under the barricades the police had put up. The horror and terror in his bright blue eyes. That was something Haro never wanted to see in his son's expression ever. Enji! Haro stuttered out, instinctively reaching his right arm up to his young son. When had Enji grown so much? He was already at shoulder height to him. And Haro was six foot tall. How did he just notice this? You were here? The thought that his son had witnessed him being crushed by a building terrified him more than the experience itself. Enji faltered for a moment, his eyes catching the various injuries on his father's face before landing on the broken arm. Before Haro could properly react, Enji had lunged forward, wrapping his surprisingly strong arms around him tightly, burying his face into his father's chest. The pressure hurt Haro's unseen wounds, causing him to wince, but he couldn't bring himself to push Enji away, needing the comfort just as much as his red-headed child did. Ow, Enji, careful! You could have died, the 13-year-old mumbled against his father's chest, voice slightly muffled. Haro placed his right hand on his boy's back, eyes widening as he heard the shakiness in Enji's voice, and it couldn't do anything. Enji's shoulders shook ever so slightly under Haro's touch, before his son had lifted his head and he saw watery blue eyes meet his own tired blue ones. I'll get strong, Enji promised like it was a declaration, and become a hero, and I'll protect you, and this won't happen again. With every sentence, his voice broke with emotion, tears welling up in his eyes. No child should have to make such a promise to their father. He was the one meant to protect Enji. But he was a weak man, wasn't he? In all these years, he hadn't even been able to honestly speak to Enji. And here was his son, 13 years old, with every reason in the world to be angry with him, for not being enough of a dad, keeping it together like no child should be able to, and who only had the desire to protect his father. Haro didn't deserve that. Didn't deserve him. He loved his son so much. A small, warm smile tugged at Haro's cheeks, the first real smile in an awfully long time. He moved his hand from Enji's back to the base of his head and brought him against his chest again, hugging him best he could. He nuzzled his son's red hair as tears of his own threatened to spill. Thank you, Enji, he said, voice tight of emotion. I... I promise I'll do... be... better. This was a second chance, and he had to take it, for Angie's sake. Chapter 2 Spark Angie had just been leaving school when the attack began. He had been alone, not really want to make friends. It's not because he didn't want any, he just struggled. He found it hard to relate to the other kids, and the kids found him hard to approach with how serious and stern he looked. He didn't know why he was this way. Just personality, he guessed. And after-school clubs weren't his thing, neither. Mainly because he needed to get groceries and go home. It was just his father and him. His father worked a lot and was always busy, so Enji took it upon himself to clean their small apartment and look after them both. If he didn't, the trash would pile up and his father would forget to eat. So, he had been on his way to the store, which was on the way home, and close to both his middle school and his elementary school in which his father worked at as a sports coach. Enji knew he still had a late PE class to teach for some of the more sportsy students, so he could do some shopping before meeting his father at the school gates and walking home with him. This was one of the very few moments he got to spend time with his father, and he cherished those moments. That's all he wanted, really, to spend time with his father. The ground had suddenly shaken violently, throwing Enji to the ground. Confused and a little rattled, he looked up, seeing dust rise a short distance away, in the direction of his father's workplace. Panic gripped his chest, and before he realised what he was doing, he was sprinting towards the dust as cries and shouts started echoing. School children, teachers and bystanders were running away from the scene, so Enji had to force and push his way forward, trying to see his father in the chaos. Call the police! What happened? A villain attack! Are there any heroes? The voices screamed and bounced in Enji's skull, as all he could think about was his father. And then he saw him. As he reached the gates of the school, he saw his father in the distance. He was trying to run out of the gymnasium that was crumbling down, pulling on the arm of the young girl. Before Enji could do so much as shout for him, the building collapsed, crushing both the girl and his father. The world froze for Enji. His breath caught in his throat as he stood frozen, unable to move. He couldn't feel his fingers, and his heart felt like it had stopped. Around him, the noises dulled out into quiet rumbles as he stared at the crumbled building that buried his father. He hadn't been able to do anything. His father had been right there, and Enji wasn't able to help. 
he was too weak. Somewhere in the dust and chaos, he could see the silhouette of the villain, but Engie couldn't move, just stared in wide-eyed shock. Finally, police cars, ambulance and a couple heroes arrived at the scene, but they didn't even notice Engie, going straight into action to take down the villain that was destroying the school for whatever reason. Or maybe no reason at all. The crime rates were so high in Japan at the moment, things like this happened far too often. Not that anybody ever got used to it, the ways villains attacked varied immensely depending on the nature of their quirks. As the villain was taken down, the police set up barricades to keep people out of the scene, and first responders started looking for survivors. In all this time, Engie had barely blinked. His mind couldn't make sense of what he had seen, couldn't take his eyes off from the spot he saw his father being crushed. There wasn't even any motion. Just... nothing. Hey, kid, a voice called to him, snapping him out of his trance, turning to look wide-eyed at the adult. You shouldn't be here, it's dangerous. Andrew didn't respond, just stared, arms awkwardly at his side as he tried to collect himself. Despite being 13, Andrew was almost the same height as the police officer, but his face was still young and he wore his middle school uniform. Kid? The adult said with a concerned tone. Still, Andrew said nothing, brain short-circuited. Why was he unable to think? Why was he so weak that he couldn't even move? Maybe if he wasn't so weak, he could have saved his father. How many other children went through this, felt so helpless and pathetic for not doing more, for being stronger? His father died because he was too weak. A familiar figure caught the corner of his eye, and he snapped his head to look at it. Father! He cried out as soon as he saw his father's dark burgundy hair, ducking under the barricades and sprinting forward. He didn't even hear the police officer calling after him. His father's face was bruised, he was bleeding from the nose and mouth, and his left arm was messily bandaged, held up in a sling. He heard his father's voice, but not what he was saying, and threw himself onto the man, hugging him like he had never before. He was warm, alive. Engie buried his face in his father's chest, taking in the comforting warmth he remembered from when he was a small child. He could feel his heartbeat, and under the smell of dust and blood, he recognised his father's scent of smoked oakwood, a telltale sign of his fire quirk, despite it being a weak one. You, you could have died, and I couldn't do anything. Engie lamented into his father's chest, gripping onto his clothes tightly, afraid that if he let go, his father would disappear. Emotion finally bubbled into his throat, his eyes burning. It wasn't the familiar burn of his own fire, but the uncomfortable prickle of tears. I'll get strong, he gasped out with a cry, looking up to his father's blue eyes that were exactly like his own. And become a hero, and I'll protect you, and this won't happen again. The emotion was making his voice hitch. He wasn't one for crying, but he couldn't help it. It was stronger than him. He had never felt so terrified and relieved at the same time, the horror from before catching up to him and clashing with the relief of seeing his father's bruised but expressive face. Becoming a pro hero hadn't ever been a fault to him. He didn't like the celebrity side of things, seeing how heroes had to socialise and do PR stunts for the sake of the population. That wasn't Engie's strong point at all, so he had considered becoming something more efficient and less glitzy to help his country. But now, having seen this destruction firsthand, he realised that wasn't enough. His father could have easily died here, just like hundreds of others had because of villains and quirk-related incidents. Engie didn't want that to happen, didn't want other children feeling the way he just had. And most importantly, he wanted to protect his father. He didn't want to be weak anymore. A soft smile graced his father's face, and Engie stared, wide-eyed. He hadn't seen his father smile in... forever, and something about it eased away the horror, comforting him. The hand that he had noticed resting on his back moved to the base of his head, and his father pulled him into another hug, nuzzling his hair. Thank you, Engie, his father's warm voice said, and Engie could hear the emotion in his voice. I... I promise I'll do... be... better. Engie blinked against his chest, not understanding in this moment what that meant. His father hadn't done anything wrong, he was just busy. But it verbalised something that Engie didn't realise he needed to hear. His father wanted to be here, with him, for him. Engie finally let himself be a 13-year-old child and the tears spilled, wetting the front of his father's dirty t-shirt. Chapter 3. Flicker. Haro kept his promise to be better. He spent more time with Engie and properly planned his time so that he wasn't so busy anymore. Yes, he was still stressed and overwork, 
That is the nature of being any teacher at an elementary school. But he had made efforts to not be a pushover anymore. He didn't take on more work than what he was supposed to, even if it lost him some good favours with a few of the other teachers. But he didn't care. He had almost died during the villain attack, and during his recovery, he knew that the stress of work would be the thing to kill him instead if he didn't make a proper change. The first thing he did when he was out of the hospital and could be back home was cooking dinner with Engie. It had just been a simple curry and rice, but it had been fun. Engie was a good cook for a kid his age, and they had, awkwardly, chatted about their food preferences. Turns out, they had pretty similar tastes, other than on fish. Haro hated fish, while Engie really liked sashimi. Haro said they should go out for sushi. Engie had been hesitant. He knew of his father's financial struggles of raising a child alone while on the salary of a teacher. That's for me to worry about. Haro had reassured, patting his son on the shoulder with a slight awkward stiffness. Engie had replied with a, hmm. Haro spent the rest of his recovery at home, sorting out his schedule while talking to Engie, trying to become more comfortable with talking to his only family member. It took a while since both of them struggled with expressing their thoughts, but by the time Haro went back to work, he'd been able to learn a bit more about his son. Engie likes sports, his favourite food is kuzumochi, and he's atop of all his classes. And as Haro had feared, he didn't have any friends. So he made an appointment with his main teacher, a nice woman who praised Engie's work ethic, intelligence, and interest in class, but who admitted she found him intimidating and the kids didn't find him approachable. Haro felt like that was his fault since he never made the effort to help Engie socialise with other kids his age. Engie's mother had also been stubborn with an attitude, so he was sure that played a part into it as well, but he could have nurtured Engie to be less... Well, less like him, less awkward. Engie, on the other hand, even if he couldn't show it, was delighted at his father spending time with him and meeting his teacher. Haro had praised him for his hard work, something he had never needed to succeed, but it made him happy nonetheless that his father was proud. Engie liked learning, and he liked the structure of school and education. It's where he thrived. And you're not worried about the other kids not hanging out with you? Haro had asked at one point. Engie thought, then shrugged. I don't know. I guess it doesn't worry me. He had replied, but clearly there was a lot left unspoken that he was unable to express. To Engie, if the other kids didn't want to be friends with him for whatever reason, he didn't want to force them. Having friends could be nice, but he didn't know what that meant to have any, and what he did see of the other boys his age, it didn't appeal to him. Hmm. But if you want to be a hero, you need people to believe in you, no? Haro had pondered as he walked beside his son. Though on the way home from school, Haro having started to plan his time better so he could be the one to meet Engie instead of Engie walking alone. He noticed his son's eyebrows knitting together in a small, thoughtful frown, face looking serious. Hey, come on, you're too young to make an expression like that. Haro laughed a little. He reached for his son's face with his sealed left arm, pulling at his cheek a bit. Engie jolted at the act and stared incredulously at his father for daring to pinch his cheek. It only made Haro laugh again, not realising how expressive Engie could be at times. Seeing his young father laugh, Engie's face relaxed and he let out a small amused exhale himself, the smallest of smiles tugging at the corner of his mouth. Engie had been serious about becoming a hero. Ever since the accident, he went full throttle with doing research on what steps he should take and what changes were needed in Japan. Crime rates were high, he already knew that, and one of the leading problems was lack of leadership and resources. The population had nobody to look up to. The villains had no singular figure to fear, there was a lack of consequences, hundreds of unsolved cases, the lack of support for unusual quirks, and so much more amalgamated into too much for the country to handle. What people needed was something to focus on. A symbol. And if Engie wanted to even attempt at being that, he'd need to work hard. Extremely hard. At 13 years old, Engie started a rigid and harsh training program that he had personalised based on interviews of heroes and fitness coaches. It started with early morning runs every day before school, followed by push-ups and other typical muscle training. At first, it was terrible. His body hurt in ways he didn't think possible, and the daily challenge to get up early when all he wanted to do was sleep was more strenuous from than the training itself. But the feeling of completion he got whenever he finished his morning workout was amazing, and it made him ready to face the day. And so, as the weeks went by, NG upped the training and workouts. He knew his father couldn't afford the training equipment he'd want, so he had to make do with common things in the house. The shopping bags, the heavy phone book, rearrange furniture, even helping his father with moving equipment at the elementary school. Haro had, of course, noticed this newfound motivation and drive, but didn't say anything for the first few months after he had returned to work. He wanted to let Engie find his rhythm for now, get a feel for exercising, but he did observe him. Alongside training his body to become stronger, Engie started experimenting with his fire quirk more. It was much stronger than his father's. From what little he knew of his mother, she had some sort of power-up quirk, though it wasn't very impressive, apparently. Whatever it was, his parents' weak quirks must have combined to give him his powerful fire, but he didn't know how powerful it was exactly, which is why he wanted to practice with it. It started simple. Just manifest the flames and get a feel for them. Very soon, he realised he needed to up his endurance. 
Where he could contain a lot of firepower, his body was fairly quick to overheat. This bothered him more than he was willing to admit. So, he went full throttle with finding ways to up his endurance. Right now, he couldn't do much about his body overheating if his body was weak to begin with, so he concentrated on strengthening the fundamentals before he concentrated on his quirk. This is when Harrow intervened. I can coach you if you want, Harrow offered at the end of the first term of middle school. The term had started in April, and it was now July. NG had looked at him in surprise. Since you're going to have more free time soon, I have, I'll have less work too. I thought we could train together, give you some tips and such. It took his entire being to fully express what he was offering, a slight nervousness in his tone. Yes, please. And you replied with a somewhat embarrassed expression. That became a new way for them to bond. They trained together, Harry giving tips and guidance so that Engie could get stronger without injuring himself. Honestly, Harry was impressed at his son's tenacity and drive, keeping up with his father with little to no problem. Even under the blaring summer sun, Engie never complained. When the 8th of August came round, Harry kept his promise and treated Engie to sushi as a birthday gift. Again, Engie had been hesitant, but Harry had brushed off his worries, telling him it was his birthday. That, and you deserve a treat. You've worked so hard on getting stronger, you need something nice as a reward, Harrow said with a soft smile. That was something he did a lot more these days. Smile. Enji became noticeably quiet, a sign of him getting bashful, and ate his sashimi without arguing. By the time the new school term had started in September, Enji was already in shape. At 14, he was barely a couple inches off of being six foot tall, and the training had made him broad. While some of the girls in his class were more than a little delighted at his appearance, it only made majority of the class avoid him even more. They didn't know his intentions of becoming a hero, so had no idea as to why he was training like this. Enji didn't know how to bring it up to them without feeling awkward and maybe a little embarrassed, so he said nothing when he heard the whispers of the students around him. Instead, now that he was much stronger, he focused on his fire quirk. While Harrow's was weak, he did still sit down with Enji and helped him understand it. I think the most important thing is how to stop the flames, Harrow said as he lit a small flame in the palm of his hand before extinguishing it. Enji gave him a confused look. Even with a quirk like mine, candlelight, fire is still dangerous. One small flame can cause a house fire. Your quirk is so much more powerful than mine, and I don't want you to lose control. Enji's expression turned from confusion to thoughtful, but Hara realized this because Enji had taken what he said the wrong way. There was a very subtle crease between his son's eyebrows, and he knew that meant Enji was overthinking what he said. He started panicking. I, I think you can control it, he said hurriedly, grabbing his son's wrist to bring him back to the conversation. Enji blinked rapidly, his confused expression returning. I didn't mean... He sighed, biting his lower lip as he struggled to find the words. I know you can control it. You will, but for now, the starting steps. I want you to be careful. His face softened, looking at his son's troubled blue eyes. For me, please. Realization dawned on Engie's expression. He had been internally criticizing himself, thinking his father had called him weak for not being in full control of his flames yet, something he already thought himself. But no, his father was just concerned for his health, more than Engie was himself. He gave his father a nod. For the next few months, until the second term ended in December, Harrow helped Engie control his flames. They started small before upping the firepower, along with continuing the physical training. Slowly but surely, Engie's body got more and more used to the heat, until Engie could engulf his entire body in flames without overheating for well over an hour. They usually practiced in the bathroom, where Harrow was armed with a shower head just in case anything went wrong. Only a couple times did he have to soak his son in freezing water, both times ending in hysterics as Engie spluttered from the face full of icy water, causing Harrow to laugh at the scene. When the weather became colder, Harrow and Engie realized they could practice out in the park, away from others, since the iciness helped keeping Engie's body temperature down. While Engie had wanted to continue training even over the seasonal festivities, Harrow had encouraged him to take a break and have some fun, enjoying tasty food and a few events happening around their area. Begrudgingly, Engie partook in them with his father, and while he didn't admit it, he had fun. Really, he had fun when he spent time with his father. Seeing the man have a good time and not look so exhausted made Engie happy. Harrow's mood and whole life had noticeably brightened, and his students noticed it too. He still worked a lot and stressed unnecessarily over things, but he smiled, laughed, and wasn't so tired all the time. Reprioritizing his life had given him a newfound love for his job, which made it much easier to live out his days. March 20th arrived, and Engie celebrated his father's birthday by making him his favorite foods and spending time with him, too young to really buy or plan anything big. Harrow couldn't ask for a better birthday gift than quality time with his son. That's how the rest of Engie's middle school years went. Harrow coaching him through his training of both his body and quirk, 
while succeeding in school, despite the lack of friends and social life. By the time Enji was in his last year, he was the same height as Haro and already a wall of muscle. It did worry Haro a little, as he knew it made his son look older than he actually was. He didn't want others to forget that Enji was still a child. Following his desire to become a hero, Enji applied to UA and obliterated both entrance exams. He scored four points for the written exam and over 100 points in the practical exam. It had left the UA's teachers quite baffled, not just because he had such control over his health lane, as it had been officially called on his ID, but because he was so observant. During the practical exam, Enji had been destroying the robotic enemies as required, but kept the collateral damage to a minimum, even looking out for the other candidates who weren't keeping an eye out for their surroundings. I can't believe you weren't nervous. Haro said, looking pale as Enji told him about how it all went. I think I would have passed out. I knew it'd be fine. I had you to coach me, Enji said flatly as he took a mouthful of rice. This caused Haro to get a little flustered, cheeks going red at the compliment. I don't think any amount of training with me could prepare you for robots, he said with an embarrassed laugh, gaining a smile from Enji. The robots did catch me off guard. He admitted. It was only when he got the results to the test informing him he was accepted into UA that his fellow middle school classmates realised what his intentions had been all along. Todoroki, why did you never tell us? One of the boys lamented, looking destroyed for assuming the worst of the tall redhead. You never asked, Enji replied flatly, as if it was obvious. It caused his classmates to all laugh awkwardly, his blunt way of speaking not something they were used to. I guess not, a girl said with a laugh. But congratulations, that's amazing. All your hard work paid off. Hmm. <laughs> Enji snorted as he put his things into his bag. The hard work is only starting. His rough tone threw his classmates off, making them deflate a little bit, and Enji realised just how socially inept he really was. He didn't mean to be rude. Without saying another word, he collected his things and left. He didn't see those classmates again. You're allowed to be proud of yourself. His father scorned him when Enji retold the events of his last school day during dinner. The girl is right. Your hard work did pay off. Enji grumbled at that, clearly disagreeing. Don't you grumble at me, mister. Enji glared at his miso soup instead. Haro sighed deeply. He wasn't sure when this had developed, but Enji had grown incredibly strict with himself. That had always been the case, but for some reason, his hard work attitude had made him unable to simply be proud of his achievements over the last year of middle school. Compared to his first year of training, where Enji had been proud of each milestone, he had slowly started to gain the mentality that it simply wasn't enough. Haro believed he was watching the news too much, and seeing just how bad the crime truly was. Well... Whatever. I think you should be proud of yourself, because I'm very proud of you, he said with a softer tone, looking fondly at his son. Enji returned the look, grumpy at first, but seeing the loving expression in his father's face, his own relaxed and he smiled a little. I know it's pretty early, but do you have any ideas for what hero name you want? Enji nodded. He'd had it for a while now. Endeavour. Chapter 4. Crackling. Yue was arduous, an environment Enji thrived in, and Hara could see the cracks forming in Enji's psyche. On one hand, there was nothing to worry about. Enji was doing amazing in his studies as per usual. He was improving every day with his quirk and hero skills and was already making a name for himself. He even managed to become class representative thanks to his no-nonsense and organised attitude that the others in his class appreciated. But on the other hand, ever since the sports festival where Enji had finished in first place, Haro saw something shift in his son that he really didn't like. There was an edge in the blue of Enji's eyes that never seemed to go away. In all his stoicism, there was a restlessness. He really didn't like it, but he wasn't sure how to approach it. He thought back to the events of the sports festival. There had been a race at first, and Enji had been at the very front since the start, not even using his quirk except to destroy obstacles. Haro had been thoroughly impressed at his son's sheer physical strength, and even more so in the next preliminary rounds, where Enji showed incredible leadership and observation skills to get the advantage. His corporation was lacking, but that didn't seem to hold him back. Though, that's one thing that worried Haro. He had hoped that, being in the hero course, Enji would find people he could bond with. But clearly, that hadn't happened. The other kids seemed friendly towards him, but not really interacting with him like they would friends. For one of the rounds, the four-person team he was a part of seemed to just follow orders rather than cooperate with him. And then the main event took place, where the students fought each other. It started off... Fine, with Enji beating each opponent with little difficulty. But then, towards the last couple of fights, something changed. His flames were wilder, the air sweltering with heat, and his movements became more potent, aggressive, desperate. Why? Haro thought. Why did he seem desperate to win? Even when he won, fair and square, due to his own skills, looking at his medal on the podium, even then could Haro see dissatisfaction in Enji's expression. It was subtle. Anybody else who didn't know Enji wouldn't know what he was thinking, but Haro had spent enough time trying to understand his son to notice the movements of his face. Enji wasn't happy with himself, and he was destroying himself in the process. 
It's sort of coming home with bandages and peeking from under his uniform. He claimed it was just the consequences of being in the hero course. Then he started coming home late. He claimed he had after school training. And finally, he would go out on late night runs, he claimed, and not come back till early in the morning with barely enough time to sleep and get ready for school again. This went on for a couple months before Harrow couldn't take it anymore. Okay, enough, Harrow said, placing his feet firmly on the ground as he stood in front of the door, arms crossed. It was a Saturday evening. An NG, eye level of his father, was in his workout clothes with all intents to go out training again. You're taking tonight and tomorrow off. What? NG asked, confused. You heard me, Harrow emphasized forcefully. You're overworking yourself. You need a break. Sit down. No. His son's voice came out tight and almost insulted. I'm going out to train. No, Harrow replied with just as much of an insulted tone. You're not. The two stared at each other for a while, Engie looking frustrated with a twinge of anger creeping in. His shoulders were ever so slightly hunched and if Harrow didn't know any better, he thought Engie was going to punch him. Engie sighed angrily and stumped to the living room, aggressively sitting on the couch. Harrow sighed as well, but out of exasperation. What's with you? He walked over to his son, standing over him. You've never acted this way before. Engie stuck out his lower lip and crossed his arms, glaring at the wall in front of him as if he hoped it would burn up. Engie! The stern tone of his voice caught Engie by surprise, the usual softness completely gone. I don't know, he admitted, slumping into the couch properly. He looked defeated. This wasn't like him at all. Harrow sat beside him, arms resting against his own thighs as he observed his son's muted expression. They sat next to each other in silence, Harrow giving Engie time to properly form his thoughts. No matter what I do, it's just not enough, Engie finally said, slowly and carefully, like he was speaking for the first time. How is it not enough? Harrow was genuinely confused. You're top of your class and class rep. You're improving faster than everyone else. You came first at the sports festival. Your teachers only have positive things to say about your work. I mean, your teamwork skills could do with some love and care, but you're doing amazing. Why is it not enough? I don't know, NG exclaimed, rubbing his hands over his face, frustrated. I don't know. It's, it's just not. There's a crack in his voice as if he was going to cry. Hey, hey, it's okay. Harrow reassured hurriedly, wrapping an arm around his son's shoulder and pulling him against himself, hand resting on the side of Engie's head as he softly stroked his red hair. Harrow rested his cheek against the top of his head. It's okay. Engie let out a shaky exhale and shut his eyes, leaning into his father's warmth. This felt comforting, much like at the time of the accident years ago. Everything from his smile to his touch was the same, and it helped NG ease his own emotions that he found so difficult to regulate, even if the memory of the accident was one that haunted him on the daily. I just... I don't know why, he said in a small voice. I feel so weak. That shocked Harrow. How could a six-foot-tall, 16-year-old muscular powerhouse of a son feel weak? That just wasn't the word to describe him. That's okay. You're at UA to get stronger, Harrow reassured, never stopping to stroke his hair. This is just your first year. You're still a kid. You have years to get stronger at the right pace, without unnecessarily hurting yourself. The teenager sighed softly, turning his face into his father's chest properly, the cozy atmosphere starting to make him sleepy. The lack of a proper night's rest was finally catching up to him. Harrow noticed this and shifted around on the couch so Engie was fully laying on it while Harrow was half laying, supporting Engie's head on his shoulder. He was grateful they had a long couch, otherwise this would have been difficult. Engie to Doroki. You are an amazing student, an amazing son, and you need to be kinder to yourself. Harrow said softly, looking at his son's relaxed face, not having seen it for a while. You're going above and beyond what kids your age are doing. It's okay to take breaks. But... Engie started, a small yawn interrupting him, and he sighed lazily. But what if it's not enough? You're literally falling asleep on my chest. I think that's a good sign, but it's enough for now. Harrow chuckled lightly as his son drifted off to sleep. He watched him, stroking the hair out of his face to more observe his son's features. He looked almost nothing like his mother. The eye shape was there, but his mother had black hair and soft, round shapes. Harrow believed that's part of the reason why she never connected with Engie when he was born, and why it encouraged her postnatal depression. He had tried to help her, but clearly it hadn't been enough. Not enough. Oh, maybe insecurities were genetic, Harrow thought to himself, or he had nurtured those insecurities in Engie. Oh god, he really hoped not. Making Engie feel like his actions weren't enough was the last thing that Harrow wanted. He sighed softly and leaned his head back, looking at the ceiling. Engie will make for a phenomenal and efficient pro hero. That he was sure of. One that nobody else could keep up with. But Harrow needed to keep up with him, somehow. For Engie's sake, so he wasn't alone. How could he do that? Surprisingly, Harrow found his solution in 
camping. Really, it was just tagging along to Engie's training sessions that hadn't actually been going on runs, but training at a mountainous region called Sakota Peak. Engie had gotten an earful from his father for not telling him the truth. But now, instead of Engie disappearing every night to train, they had made a compromise. If Engie agreed to come home at proper times and stay home, Hara and him would go set up camp on Saturday nights and spend their Sundays training there. Mostly, it was Engie training and Hara making sure he looked after himself by eating and taking breaks. But it gave Hara a chance to watch and be interested in what his son was doing. He even managed to get his own schoolwork done. Something about being in the mountains was very relaxing and fun. The first few weeks, all Engie did was train, with Haro desperately force-feeding him water. But after a while, Haro started pointing out plants and animals to Engie, distracting him from his training. Well, initially, Engie was irritated and became grumpy every time his father tried to show him a bird up in a tree, he eventually started to relax and actually look at his surroundings. Engie wanted to get stronger, desperately so, needing to prove to himself that he wasn't weak. But as he crawled out of his tent one early morning to start training, he looked out onto the landscape and saw the sun peeking through the tops of the mountains, the lights making the waters of the lake glitter. Beautiful, he thought. He hadn't ever appreciated it before. He went to sit down by the water and looked at his own reflection. That's also something he hadn't done in a while. He looked angry, even though he wasn't. Why was that? He pondered, rubbing his face as if trying to soothe out his sharp edges. Hearing a yawn behind him, Engie looked over to his father, half-heartedly pulling himself out of his tent. Morning, he yawned, reaching for the camping food equipment to make himself some coffee. Good morning, Engie replied, looking back to his reflection. Father, mm, dad, that felt nicer to say. It definitely caught Haro's attention. Why am I like this? All he received was a couple of confused blinks and a head tilt from his father. Unable to... He made some hand motions towards himself. He sighed, dropping his hands onto his thighs as he looked back at the waters. Unable to socialize? His father's voice was closer, the man having made his way to the edge of the water. Engie hummed in reply. I don't know. I'm not good at it either. I think it's just personality. But you managed to get a wife. Engie reminded him, looking up at his father. The expression on his face was one of sad amusement. Mm, well, as you can tell, she's not here, he said with a weak chuckle, sitting down beside Engie. Listen, your mother had a strong attitude. You definitely got that from her. Engie stuck out his lower lip in a pout that showed he did not appreciate the comment, and it made Haro laugh. Especially when you're being stubborn. That pout of yours is all her, Engie grumbled. Your mother had an attitude, and I found it charming, and she liked the attention I gave her. But as you know, there's a reason I'm only 18 years older than you, Haro continued, watching the sunrise. We rushed it. We had barely graduated high school when we got married and had you. It seemed like the only logical option for us, but he didn't want to say it was a mistake. Because Engie being born was the best thing that happened to him, and he was his pride and joy. Your mother wasn't ready, and turns out I wasn't what she needed. So yes, I managed to get a wife, but it's only because of circumstance and brash decisions. Engie blinked. It didn't exactly answer his questions of why teamwork and socializing was hard for him, but it seemed to have gotten it from his rather meek and awkward father. He hummed, watching him. Do you miss her? He asked. Sometimes, Haro admitted, before looking at an with a conflicted expression. Do you miss her? Or miss having a mother? Engie stared, a little wide-eyed. Truthfully, he had never thought about it. I guess not. I can't miss something I never had. The reply was blunt, and it hurt Haro's chest a little. No, am I too interested in knowing someone who abandoned you. That hurt even more. Your mother had struggles, he said meekly, gaining a displeased frown from his son. As do you. Engie said firmly. Harrow wanted to argue that he was doing fine, and that his mother's issues had been more severe and important, but he stopped. That's not what his son needed to hear. And so do you. It's normal, he said softly, reaching out to push his son's bed hair out of his face. But as you taught me, we don't have to struggle alone. Engie gave him a confused look. I never taught you that. Maybe not directly, but just by experiencing life with me. Harrow smiled softly, pinching his son's cheek slightly to tease him. Engie let out a groan of annoyance as he rubbed his cheek, Harrow laughing and standing up. I'm making breakfast. They spent the rest of the Sunday training before heading back home in the evening. When they were walking down the mountainside, the area lit by his father's candlelight quirk, Engie spoke up again. Do you think I'll ever get married? He asked, a little embarrassed. Harrow glanced at him. Do you want to? He responded with a smile. Hmm, I don't know. If I can't make friends, finding a wife sounds impossible. 
he mumbled, head lowered a little. Harris stopped and turned to him, the light from his weak flame making Engie's glimmer in the darkness. There's somebody for everyone out there. I might not have found the right person, but that doesn't mean that's going to be the same for you, his father reassured. So even a grumpy face like you can find a wife. Engie snorted at the tease, a smile threatening to appear. Things became easier for Engie after that, his mentality having lightened, if only by little. He still found it hard to be kind to himself, but at least it wasn't destroying his body. His pro-hero teachers noticed, so during the next parent-teacher conference, that was brought up. I've been accompanying Engie when he trains, Harrow explained. I think it's better for him when he's not doing things alone. He gets stuck in his own head otherwise, something his mother definitely used to do. He hoped that learning from his failed relationship with her would make him able to support his relationship with his son, as well as his son's well-being. Ah, that explains a lot, the pro-hero nodded. Though, you mention him training after school... I thought as barring him from using the training grounds after school hours would have deterred him from overworking himself, but it seems we underestimated his stubbornness. Wait, what? Harrow asked, confused. You banned him from the training grounds? Just for after school, the teacher reassured. He was staying far too late past what is safe, and Recovery Girl was getting tired of seeing him every single day. He didn't tell me that. That would explain why he started going out late, as well as the bandages. I see. Thank you for telling me. I'll be sure to bring it up with him. Other than that, Enji Todoroki is extremely driven and motivated. He's a spectacular student, hard-working and highly skilled. You've brought him up well, the teacher praised, making Haro laugh a little nervously as he remembered the earlier years of not doing nearly enough for his child. Enji knew he was in trouble the second he saw his father leave the teacher's office. You were banned from the training grounds? Haro asked, incredulous. And you didn't tell me? All Enji did was pout and look away. The rest of UA was smooth sailing, for the most part. He got his provisional license first try, gained plenty of experience with various pro heroes, and truly made a name for himself as Endeavor. He never managed to rid himself of his insecurities though. They weren't as prominent, but still very much bubbling under the surface. With his stature, his physical abilities, his flashy quirks and hard work, it all led to Endeavor becoming extremely popular very quickly. Nothing could get in his way. Until Enji was fresh out of UA, and his only rival was All Might the number one hero. Chapter 5. Shine. Enji had never despised the man more in his life. All Might's strength was infuriating. Whatever flames of ambition had stifled during Enji's first year at UA, they were reignited like an angry inferno. Because of this, Enji poured all his time and effort into Endeavor, to the point that by his second year as a pro hero, at the young age of 20, he had reached the number two spot, just under All Might, and that only made it worse. Despite everything, all his training, all the cases he solved, all his progress, it still wasn't enough. He was never going to be the strongest, nor the most powerful, because All Might was standing in his way. Whenever he got compared to All Might, he couldn't help but feel a blazing fury in his chest, alongside an unwanted respect for the man and his strength. If all this was just about the title and being number one in terms of rankings, all Endeavor had to do was to be liked by the public more, pandered to fan service. But that's not what he wanted nor cared about. He wanted to be stronger, he wanted more power, he wanted to surpass All Might. But the blonde seemed to have no limits on what he could do, while Endeavor had physical limitations he could not overcome, no matter how hard he tried. It was as if the universe was just again proving to Enji how he would never succeed the way he wanted to. You're doing it again, Harrow scorned with a tired sigh rolling up the magazine he was reading as if he intended to whack some censor to his son with it. You continue glaring at that TV and I'm turning it off. I'm not a toddler, NG grunted. He received a gentle but firm smack on the top of the head. You keep acting like one, I keep treating you like one. Harrow huffed back, leaning over the table before continuing to watch the news on the TV. Man, All Might sure is impressive. Doing all these things alone, it's incredible. It's ridiculous, the redhead growled out, displeased. It's one thing for the media to praise the wannabe American, it's another thing for his father to praise him. He refused to admit it was petty jealousy. Haro noticed immediately. Why are you so jealous? Can't you just appreciate everything the man is doing and rejoice with the rest of Japan? He asked. Over the last couple years, he had learned that being honest and blunt with Enji was the best way to get his thoughts and emotions across. While the way he spoke to Enji might have been a bit much to other people, it's exactly the way Enji needed it. It's not about that. Enji growled, hunching his shoulders. Hado sighed, desperately trying to understand his son's frustrations, but it just wasn't happening. As soon as All Might had made his beginnings in Japan after returning from America, Hado knew it would affect Enji negatively, and within the first year of being a pro hero, he had already seen his angry decline. He tried to talk about it with him, tried to connect like he had in his first year at UA, but it was different this time. Unlike before where the emotions were targeted at Enji himself, now he was projecting his frustrations onto All Might. Hado didn't know how to drag him out of that mindset, and he didn't get the chance even 
to even try anyway, seeing how Enji was pouring every breathing moment into his duties and training. It was just tiring to look at, but Enji drove forward like an unstoppable steam engine, puffing included. This time round, Haro couldn't keep up. Enji stood in his negativity and rage as he continued to watch the news until the segment was over, then wordlessly got up from the couch to get dinner ready for him and his father. They had moved out of their tight apartment the moment Endeavor had started making good steady money, and now they lived in a massive traditional Japanese home. It was much more than anything Haro had ever dreamed of asking, but it was clear that Enji wanted his father to be comfortable and not stress about his living conditions anymore. In theory, Haro could even retire early from his teacher role, but the idea of having nothing to do all day put him off. He was still a workaholic after all. With Enji getting dinner done and the TV still on, Haro continued to watch it, until eventually an interview of All Might popped up. Despite his physique, All Might was clearly young. From what Haro remembered, the number one hero had graduated from UA not too long before Enji had entered it, then left for the United States. Having so much power and responsibilities at such a young age, that couldn't be easy. He saw how exhausted and worn out Enji was every day when he came home from his agency, and that was without being the symbol of peace for the entire country. Haro couldn't begin to imagine the pressures of that. He wondered if All Might ever took breaks. Enji returned with food the main dish being a chicken and egg fried bowl, along with other side dishes like miso soup and steamed vegetables. As they started eating, Haro could see that Enji was still grumpy because of earlier. How's your agency going? Good. Enji replied in between bites. Yue is looking for internship spots for their older students. I'm getting the newer sidekicks ready so that they know what to do if I see any potential students. That's something Haro had quickly caught up on. While Enji was terrible at everyday interactions, he was amazing and dedicated to his hero job. No wonder he'd become number two so quickly. He was efficient, observant, and an ideal teacher for his fellow heroes. Haro liked to jokingly take the credit for that last one. Although it did pain him every time he heard somebody criticize Endeavor for being too harsh and not being charismatic like the other heroes. That was the one thing neither Hadaro nor Yue were ever able to nurture in Enji. Wow, it's already been two years. That's crazy to think about, Hadaro pondered as he looked at his now adult son. And you have that billboard chart event coming up for being officially the new number two. You better be proud of yourself, Enji, I swear. The last bit was said of a suspicious squint and the clacking of Hadaro's chopsticks in Enji's direction. Enji gave him a disgruntled pout. Unbelievable. Number two in Japan at the age of 20 and you still can't be proud of yourself? It's not like I do that on purpose. Enji grumbled, taking a mouthful of rice. Being proud wasn't the point. Ah, well. You'll get to meet the other top heroes. I think that's pretty exciting, Haddo continued. And, you know, I think you should give All Might a chance. Enji gave him a dark, angry look. What? Get to know him. What? I'd say make friends, but we both know that's hard for you. Are you serious? Yes, Haddo said firmly. I'm very serious. You and All Might are the two most powerful men in Japan, are both young and, from what I can tell, very friendless. At least you have me around, but does All Might? Enji stared in silence. I guess he's never mentioned anyone. Enji mumbled after a while. Think about it. Imagine being in your situation, but you literally had no one, not even me. How do you think that would be? Haruo asked him, trying to get Enji to think of the scenario himself to truly get a feel for how lonely that would be. Enji didn't want to think about it at all. He had already thought about it many times throughout the years. He didn't want to admit it, but the image of the building collapsing on his father still haunted him. Not enough to be a concern, in his opinion, but just enough to forever remind him of his weakness, his inability to do anything. He didn't want to think of the type of man he'd be if his father wasn't there. It scared him. Isolating, he murmured out. Hado frowned, not understanding. It would be isolating. I... I'd definitely be stuck in my own head, he admitted more clearly, stuffing his face with more rice so his father wouldn't make him talk more. Isolating. That show was one way to describe it. A worse version of Lonely, which is what Haro was going for. But Enji clearly had more insight into being a pro hero with all that power than he ever could. Which is why he wanted to encourage Enji to at least be on good terms of All Might, as he felt they could understand each other if given the chance. You don't have to be best buddies with him, you can still think of him as a rival, but don't you think that maybe he needs to know that you have his back? As number two? Enji stared at his rice. Blue eyes unfocused as he processed what his father said to him. Half his back as number two? What did that have to do with anything? Then he thought some more. Number two. If being number one was like being the leader, the symbol of peace, would that technically make his own position a right-hand man of sorts? He hadn't ever really thought of it that way, I guess. He said in a quiet voice. Suddenly, he didn't feel so angry anymore. Frustrated, sure, but the idea that All Might, someone as powerful as him, could potentially be alone and, maybe, feel the way Enji did, made him consider that his anger and hatred were misdirected. Haro could see the cogs turning in Enji's mind, and he smiled, glad he could get him to think a little more about his emotions and mentality. Just make an effort, okay? He said gently. 
Once the Hero Billboard Chart Japan event came around though, Enji didn't realise just how much of an effort that would really be. Between the exhaustive media attention and extravaganza of the event, Endeavour had to really concentrate on keeping it together, not just leave the thing altogether. Fighting villains in public was one thing. Being in the spotlight for what was basically the hero's version of the Emmy Awards was a whole other can of worms that Endeavour despised. It's what had made him uninterested in being a pro hero when he was a child. He wasn't a big smiler to begin with, so being expected to smile left and right for every bleeding camera in the building simply wasn't happening. But by now, the population had gotten familiar with his stern and serious face, getting more of a reputation among certain types of fans as the dark and brooding type. Not that NG understood what any of that meant. When the main event came round, he had seen most of the top 10 heroes, but still no All Might, which annoyed him a bit. As each hero was called onto the stage from lowest ranking to highest, Endeavour took a deep breath in and activated his trademark flames around his eyes. It helped with keeping him intimidating, as well as hiding any wariness he had for his first time on the big stage like this. Number two, the announcer spoke up, clearly excited. He's been a pro hero for barely two years, but with his dedication and hard work, he skyrocketed to second rank. Flame hero, Endeavour! That's just embarrassing. He made his way onto the stage, passing by others without acknowledging neither them nor the audience. And now, number one. All the lights went off, only Endeavour's flames glowing in the dark. Our symbol of peace that has saved Japan over and over, keeping the crime rates to single digits. All Might! I am here! All Might's voice echoed through the stage loudly, the audience breaking into cheering and claps. Whatever polite cheers the other heroes had gotten, it was nothing compared to what All Might was getting right now. The spotlight shone upward onto a higher platform where All Might was standing on. He leapt off of it and landed beside Endeavor with all the dramatics of a comic book superhero. Endeavor fought the desire to sidestep away from the bombastic man. As the audience quietened down and All Might stood proud and, well, mighty, besides Endeavour. Each of the heroes got a turn to speak after the head of the Hero Commission gave a speech. Endeavour, Enji Todoroki, who struggled with simply expressing his day-to-day -day emotions to his own father, was expected to give a speech about being a pro hero, and the number two at that. Of course he had stressed about it, not that anybody would ever notice, only his father noticed those things about him. But despite that, he knew what he was going to say. The mic came to him, and all eyes stared right at the youngest pro hero in the top ten. Endeavour glanced to All Might for a moment, who towered over him, which certainly was a feat within of itself, as Endeavour had grown to an impressive 6 foot 5 by his third year at UA. Not wanting to let the second long silence linger, Endeavour looked back to the audience, who were all at the edge of their seats to hear what the stern-faced 20-year-old had to say. As number two, I will do everything in my power to support the symbol of peace. And that was that. The audience stayed silent, not understanding what Endeavour meant. All Might need support. Well, maybe in the fans supporting the idol way? That would make sense. Everybody looked up to All Might, but that didn't fit Endeavour's whole image. The crowd started mumbling among themselves, wondering if it was arrogance on Endeavour's part, saying that All Might needed aid, or if it meant he was standing beside him. All Might, despite his smile and pose never wavering, was equally as frazzled by the younger man's words and didn't know what to make of them. His turn to speak came, and the poor lady holding the mic had to go on her tiptoes to ever get a chance to reach All Might's height. The blonde hero met her halfway and bent down a little so he could speak into the mic. <laughs> all the support is always appreciated and needed. We must all work together for a bright future, he started, voice loud and confident. Endeavour immediately regretted saying anything at all, and tuned out the rest of what All Might said as he went on a short speech about something or the other to make the media and cameras happy. Endeavour couldn't wait to get off the stage, and didn't waste any time in retreating to the backstage, exhaling heavily. Oh yeah, that sucked. He better get used to it quick though, if he plan on staying number two. Endeavour! All Might's voice made him jump as he appeared out of nowhere. Turning to look at him, Endeavour recoiled at a bright, obnoxious smile. I just wanted to say a congratulations for reaching the top at such a young age. This caused Endeavour to glare at the man, eyes narrowing. The whole problem is that he hadn't reached the top. The source of that very issue standing in front of him. Same goes to you. You're not that much older than me, he replied, voice stern. Any other person would have withered away at the stoic face, but All Might just laughed. I guess you're right. Endeavour couldn't do this. He couldn't stand this sort of easy breezy, happy-go-lucky personality. It was common enough in the average hero, but All Might just turned it up to 100. It annoyed him just being in the presence of the other man. But the conversation with his father popped into his mind, and he closed his eyes for a moment. He tried to untense his shoulders and extinguish the flames around his face revealing his young features more clearly. For some reason, this seemed to throw All Might off guard, probably because Endeavour didn't show his fireless face to the public much. I meant what I said, 
on stage, Endeavor forced himself to say, as if it was taking every atom in his body to say these words. I'm your number two hero, just as much as you are our symbol of peace. Blue eyes shone from under All Might's eyebrows, staring right down at the red-haired man with equally blue eyes. They stayed in silence for a moment. Of course! As the top two pro heroes, we must support each other! All Might exclaimed with his bombastic, confident tone. Endeavor wanted to smack him. He visibly cringed, shutting his eyes as he groaned at All Might's theatrics. He hated this. He wanted to go home and tell his father this was stupid, then work himself to death. That sounded good. Will you stop with that? He growled pinching the bridge of his nose. He excelled heavily, steam combing out of his nose like a bull. It's just us. It's just us seemed to have a strange effect on the blonde hero, which Endeavor caught onto him immediately. Okay, that he could work with. Being number one, the symbol of peace, being everything that Endeavor wanted. It's a lot to bear, surely. He forced his voice to be a little softer, like the way his father spoke. It still sounded gruff and harsh, but with a sudden steadiness. When was the last time you took a break? All Might stared at the younger man. That wasn't what he expected from Endeavor, at all. From what he had seen of him, he was very matter-of-fact, all about efficiency and incredibly hard-working, if a little scary-looking. But this softness, in a way, was not at all what All Might had prepared himself for. It disarmed him completely. I, well, he stuttered, his bravado dissipating under Endeavor's bluntness. He pondered the question. I don't know. Well, wasn't that a familiar phrase? Meet me in 10, civilian clothing. Endeavor huffed out with finality, stalking off to get change without giving All Might the space to argue. Drinks on me. He had never gone out for drinks with colleagues. It's not something he did, but he knew it was a common thing for everybody else to do. Maybe he should pretend to be his age and do normal things once in a while. 10 minutes later, he was waiting for All Might at the emergency exit that was used for the backstage guests. Dressed in a long brown coat, NG wore a black turtleneck sweater, Grey jeans and black shoes. Simple, normal, the only thing making him stand out being his red hair and stature. As he waited, he grew a little impatient, thinking of just leaving All Might behind and going home. Sorry for the wait! A much calmer but recognisable voice said as the blonde hero turned the corner. He in turn was wearing green cargo pants, red shoes and a grey t-shirt that was covered by a blue and white American style baseball jacket. His hair was still up in that ridiculous hairdo, but he looked more relaxed, the white of his eyes more apparent now. Endeavor grunted in response. Mmm, you mentioned drinks. Where are we going? All Might asked, not sounding insecure per se, but cautiously curious. Normally, he would have refused the invite, but seeing how Endeavor had given him no room to argue and had pretty much commanded him, he felt like he couldn't say no. I know an izakaya nearby that caters to heroes wanting some privacy. I've gone a few times. He was going to say, I've taken my father there a few times, but he didn't want to mention his father too much if he could avoid it at this stage. Sounds perfect! All Might exclaimed with a loud voice, bright smile and thumbs up. Endeavor was once again regretting his actions. Surprisingly, due to it being late evening, Engie and All Might went relatively unnoticed by the crowds. To be fair, Engie purposely took the less busy route so that they wouldn't be stopped every two seconds by All Might fans. Some had still turned though, but the two heroes were gone faster than most could react. Enji entered the izakaya, the owner recognizing him and giving him a polite bow and greeting, before looking wide-eyed and mouth agape at seeing All Might. The latter gave him a bright smile and raised his hand in greeting. The usual room, please, Enji said to the owner, who despite being a little starstruck, professionally showed them to a private room. It had a low table, tatami mats of zabuton seats, and simply decorated walls. A calming atmosphere that was gentle in the eyes and mind. You like the traditional style, huh? All Might commented as he sat opposite Enji looking around the room with his smile still placid on. I apologize if it doesn't suit your modern Americanisms, NG replied gruffly, already knowing that what he was going to order. Hey now, I said nothing of the sorts. It was just an observation. All Might laughed, bright and warm, but it still felt like too much to NG, who simply huffed and pushed the menu towards a taller man. Drinks were ordered, as well as food, and while they stayed in an awkward silence at first, once alcohol got into their systems, the two top heroes of Japan finally managed to relax somewhat. And as they did, Enji noticed how All Might's mannerisms changed. They were more meek, polite, and almost shy in certain ways, with how carefully he held the food and drinks, as if worried to accidentally break them. It was strange, seeing such a large and bulky man being dainty with the objects that he interacted with. Hmm, Endeavor, All Might finally spoke up. Enji. Huh? Enji got a confused look from the number one. We're off work, so call me Enji. Or Todoroki. Either works, he said as he took another gulp of his beer. The blonde hero opposite him watched for a moment, considering his options before nodding. All right. Enji. What made you invite me for drinks? All Might asked, seeming cautious. Enji eyed the man. Why do you need a reason? 
The reply was gruff. Don't answer my question with another question, the blonde said with a shy laugh, much quieter and softer than before. I guess... I don't know. I didn't expect it from you. From him. Right. Angie knew he didn't come across as a type to enjoy these sorts of things. And he wasn't. Only with the people close to him. Which happened to only be his father. But hearing All Might say it forced him to acknowledge he had nobody in his life to do normal socialising things with. Do you have anyone? He asked. Excuse me? Psychics, family, friends, anybody at home. Angie was embarrassed at having asked and thinking he should have just stayed quiet. All Might didn't answer for a moment. I have friends in the United States. And my old mentor. Although I don't talk to them much these days, since I'm always busy. I don't take psychics. That implied plenty. Having left for the States, All Might must have lost connections he used to have, or relationships simply drifted. That was common. And being busy saving Japan every day didn't leave much room to make new friends. Enji let out an exhale, almost annoyed that his father had been right. Again. My father thought that was the case, he muttered. Your father? All Might gave him puppy eyes as he tilted his head a little, confused. I was... well, I was arguing with him. During that, he told me I should get to know you, since we're close in age, close in rank, and from his point of view, similar in attitude. And he said with a slight grumble into his beer, as if relaying this just validated his father's opinion. Similar in attitude? All Might laughed. A genuine light laugh, not the bombastic one he put on for the cameras. You're going to have to explain that one to me. Enji narrowed his eyes at him, but a smile couldn't help but tug at his lips, hidden behind his beer. I don't know either. You'll have to ask him, he said with a quiet chuckle, understanding the humour. All Might and Endeavour were as opposites as opposites can be when it came to attitude. If All Might was a golden Labrador, Enji was a black, very hissy cat. So your father indirectly set up a play date for the top two heroes in Japan. That made Enji splutter and choke on his drink, unable to stop the laughter as All Might's comment caught him off guard, his shoulders shaking. Seeing this genuine portrayal of smiles and laughter, All Might watched in pleasant surprise, smiling softly. Well, you're not wrong, Enji said in between chuckles as he calmed down, wiping his mouth. He has a way of just knowing how to talk me out and into things. His voice trailed off, and All Might noticed a fond look settle into the man's eyes. A lot implied and left unsaid. He sounds like a great dad. He is, Enji agreed. Things... I... would be very different without him. Definitely for the worst. Another round of drinks and food arrived at their table, and they stayed in a now comfortable silence for a little while, enjoying each other's company as they were finally relaxed and comfortable. After a short silence of the two just eating, All Might finally spoke up. You know, I was under the impression you hated me. Inji looked up at him, mouth chewing on some chicken. A questioning eyebrow raised. I looked into you a bit, just to know who this young lad climbing the rank so fast was, and I saw some of your rare interviews. There was a couple times I was mentioned... Let's just say, you looked pretty annoyed. Enji cringed internally. Was he really that obvious? Are you sure that's not just my face? I mean, it could have been. All Might laughed softly. But, I don't know. You just seemed to get angry. Enji paused, unsure of how to word himself. Maybe I did he said carefully, avoiding All Might's own questioning look. Though... Hmm. He stopped, sighing, not knowing how to continue this and now clearly looking frustrated as he rubbed his jaw. You're not good at expressing yourself, are you? All Might asked gently, noticing the man's frustration. Enji finally looked at him, eyes relieved at not having to explain himself. No, I'm not, he admitted. That's okay, the blonde reassured, smiling brightly, but not in that pro-hero way that got on Enji's nerves. It's interesting, you're amazing at communication on the field, but talking like this, that's what you find hard. I've always done better in that sort of environment. And you replied, glad the man was able to notice things about him that he couldn't express. Clearly, All Might had done some real research on him. It was nice being understood without having to explicitly lay out every detail. All Might gave a nod of understanding. It's fine if you don't know how to feel about me. I'm just glad you don't hate me, he smiled. And... the invite for drinks. I'm grateful. The softness in his voice, tinged with what could be sadness, took Enji back. All Might... Oh, we're off work, like you said. So... He interrupted, before pausing to think at what he was about to say. So you can call me Toshinori. Or Yagi. Either works. He said with a grin, copying Enji's words from earlier. Toshinori. I meant what I said. I want to support you, as number two. Enji said steadily, really thinking hard about what he was saying. Eyebrows furrowing a little at the effort of it. You don't have to struggle alone. 
He thought back at the words his father had said to him in the first year of UA, and how they resonated with him. He hoped that they would resonate with Toshinori too. They did. Toshinori looked wide-eyed at Enji for a long while, mouth slightly agape. And then his appearance changed. Not immensely, but he was... shorter. Still tall, still muscular, still an impressive build, but not the Goliath build of All Might. Rather, someone much more equal to Enji. It was Enji's turn to stare wide-eyed with his mouth agape, confused. My quirk is a power-up one, Toshinori explained vaguely, pushing his two long hair bangs out of his face that no longer stood like a V-shape. Enji blinked at the explanation before snapping out of his confusion and nodding. I normally keep this appearance for when I'm out in public, but... But I feel I can relax around you, went on said. In such a short amount of time, he felt like he found someone he could confide in. Maybe not about everything to do with his quirk, past, and purpose, but at least in the heroic side of things. Enji and he were very different, yet had striking similarities. They both worked hard, were fairly friendless, par for a couple people, and were the top two heroes in Japan. Not somebody All Might needed to protect, not someone he needed to push away. And, while well, not something to touch on right now, Toshinori felt maybe Enji shared some of his worries and insecurities. The way he spoke and acted, it felt like he knew. Different contexts, but same feelings. Enji just stared silently, in a way understanding without really getting what Toshinori was trying to imply. He was more taken aback at the shift in appearance, not having expected it. We can always pick this up another time, Enji said finally, leaving the possibility open for more meetups. Toshinori, looking almost small in his original form, smiled at him, sweet and shy. Yeah. The night ended soon after that. Back in his All Might form, Toshinori and Enji parted ways, exchanging personal phone numbers so that they could call each other at any needed time without having to go through their agencies. Enji made his way home, thinking his father would be asleep. He wasn't. Welcome home, Enji. Haru yawned, stretching from his spot on the couch where he was watching TV. So, how was it? He gave his son a knowing smile, almost a little smug. Enji pouted. I had drinks of All Might, he admitted through a grumble. And you had fun. And I had fun. Haru laughed, glad he was proven right. Having finally made his way back to his agency, only stopping a couple times for heroisms, Toshinori relaxed from his All Might form and sighed, leaning against the wall as he looked out of a window that overlooked the city. You don't have to struggle alone. All Might didn't struggle. He had to be a symbol, and failing wasn't an option. He couldn't have any liabilities, people that could be used against him or targeted. That's why he pushed almost everyone away, only keeping necessary ties like those in UA and Gran Torino. But Toshinori... Admitting it would be too difficult right now, but he couldn't help but feel an ache as Enji's words bounced around in his head. Clearly, somebody had said those words to Enji too. Probably his father, from the sound of it. Toshinori smiled a little, watching the city lights in the dark night. Maybe he could lean on his number two a little. Chapter 6. Glow. Over the next few months, Endeavour and All Might had been seen together a lot more. Between the billboard event that had taken place in early autumn, by the late spring, the media had dubbed them a powerful duo. Endeavour found it ridiculous and embarrassing, being treated by the population like a kindergartner, holding hands with his best friend. But All Might found it endearing, and honestly, it made his life easier having someone like Endeavour around. Teaming up had become the norm for the two, be it planned or accidental, which made finishing the work much faster. Although at first, Enji was territorial of his own local area, which led to a lot of bickering, like in the case of the giant squid quirk that happened in late November of the same year. As the name suggests, it was a villain with a squid-like appearance, who could turn into a giant squid. They had attacked the plaza that sold cooked calamari in protest for eating the animal. If it was just a normal protest about not eating squids or something of the sort, Endeavour wouldn't have gotten involved. Everybody was entitled to their opinion. But attacking innocent bystanders while destroying buildings was absolutely not acceptable. Endeavour got onto the scene as soon as he felt the ground grumble when on patrol. But when he had arrived, he saw All Might also arriving at the same time in the distance. All Might! He had exclaimed, surprised at the other's appearance. Oh, hello Endeavour! The other had greeted in his bombastic voice, punching one of the squid tentacles that got in his way. What a coincidence! Coincidence? This is my area! Endeavour yelled, annoyed at the other hero. Another tentacle made a swing at the fiery man, but he shut it out of the way with his fire, roasting the offending appendage which emitted a delicious calamari smell. Let me deal with this. No need, already done, All Might proclaimed. California smash! And the enemy was down, the giant squid collapsing on an empty part of the plaza, not adding more to the collateral damage than had already been done before the heroes had arrived. 
Are you insane? That could have crushed someone! Endeavor yelled as they both landed beside the defeated squid villain. Of course, he knew better than to accuse All Might of being reckless, but he was frustrated at the man for taking his win. I already checked the surroundings before my attack, you know that. All Might laughed, knowing Endeavor had done the same. Exhaling heavily, the red-haired man just grumbled. What happened to letting me back you up? He asked sharply. His eyes narrowed as if the blonde hero was an eyesore. The latter laughed jovially. It was an easy villain, it's faster this way, he said with a dismissive hand wave. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. I can deal with that easily. That got on Endeavor's nerves even more, despite knowing he was right. Something shifted behind All Might, which caught Endeavor's attention. Seems the villain wasn't completely knocked out. Oh, you can, can you? Endeavor asked flatly, taking a large step back from All Might, who looked confused. What are you- ah! The thing that had shifted was one of the villain's tentacles, which wrapped around the symbol of peace and flung him high into the air. Endeavor! All Might yelled, accusatory, as he was thrown into the sky. You said you could deal with it easily! You don't need my help! Endeavor yelled back in reply, avoiding the villain's weakened attacks. They were no longer a threat, it was just a question of knocking them out now. Which All Might did, propelling himself down onto the villain with enough force to create a weak shockwave using New Hampshire Smash. The villain reverted to their original average height sized, no longer a giant squid, and very much passed out. You could have warned me, All Might whined, looking like a kicked puppy as he walked up to Endeavor who had his arms crossed and lower lip stuck out in an annoyed pout. You should have been aware of your surroundings, he retorted, sticking his chin out in defiance. That's one of the first things we learn in New A, not to let our guard down, even if we think the villain is defeated. Don't tell me you're sulking. I'm not sulking. You so are! Don't be ridiculous. This is the scene the police arrive to, Endeavor and All Might bickering like an old married couple. A clip of All Might being thrown into the sky while Endeavor clearly did nothing to help went viral on social media, as well as the two bickering afterwards. While some criticise the top two heroes for not taking the situation more seriously, and Endeavor not helping All Might, the majority of the population found it hilarious. Their popularity as a duo just heightened. Despite Endeavor looking grumpy and like he was on the edge of blowing a fuse at any second, All Might soon learned that that was just his face. Angie was silently observant, a great listener and dependable. Even on days when All Might wasn't asking for backup of hero stuff, only asking if they could meet for drinks or meals, Enji was always up for it. He knew that if Toshinori was the one asking, it was a rare moment the blonde was taking a break, so made time for him. Toshinori had initially worried about bothering the red-haired man, but he needn't worry. In the same evening following the event of the giant squid quirk, Enji had invited Toshinori to dinner at his house due to Haruo requesting it. Toshinori shyly accepted. It was a tight fit in Enji's car, something his chauffeur Kurumada loudly complained about. You can relax, Enji said once they arrived at his large estate. All Might, a little nervously, nodded and powered down. Still impressive, just not All Might. Once Toshinori had sorted himself out, Enji had entered his home with a, I'm back. Welcome home, Enji, Haruo said happily, getting up from his seat at the coffee table where he was planning his classes for school. His eyes lit up at seeing Toshinori. All Might, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm so glad Enji brought you along. I'm Haruo Todoroki, Enji's father. Admittedly, Toshinori was quite surprised at Haruo's demeanor. First of all, Toshinori didn't look like All Might right now, and Haruo hadn't questioned that. But also, Haruo was very different to what he would have expected. He had to squint, trying to see in what way this man was Enji's father. He was tall, yes, and had the same blue eyes, but his whole demeanor was much gentler and warmer. Thank you for inviting me. Please, call me Toshinori, he said with a small, polite bow. Take a seat in the living room, I'm making dinner, Enji said gruffly as he put his work bag down. Wait, Enji, you can cook? Enji shot him a stern look. Why do you sound surprised? Because I am! The blonde laughed, gaining a displeased grunt from the redhead as he disappeared into the kitchen. Watching this, Haru was delighted at their budding friendship. Seeing All Might not wilt at Enji's harsh words and expressions, even joking with him, relieved the older man. No wonder he was number one. With a personality and attitude like that, it was hard to hate him. Well, Enji had managed to, initially, but he came around with a lot of magazine smacks to the head from Haruo. Haruo and Toshinori went into the living room like Enji had suggested, Haruo quickly scooping up his work planner from the table. Toshinori caught a glimpse of what it was. Mr. Todoroki, you're a teacher? He asked as he took a seat at the opposite the older man. I'm a coach at an elementary school nearby, Haruo nodded. It was the same one where the accident had happened years ago. With Enji having the salary he does, I don't need to work anymore, but I genuinely enjoy teaching the kids. Toshinori smiled at that. It makes sense that Enji is so hardworking and capable, with you as his father. He complimented brightly. Haruo's eyes widened a little bit, and he looked off to the side, a hint of embarrassment in his expression. Most of that is from Enji himself. I didn't do much. Haruo deflected. Now that was a lot more like Enji. 
unable to take a compliment. As Toshinori and Haro made small talk, the blonde realised that despite being more open than Enji, Haro spoke with the stiffness of someone socially awkward, having the similar speech patterns as his son. If only softer. The only thing that made Enji unlike Haruo was his intimidating and gruff attitude, otherwise they were identical. It was adorable, he thought. I was wondering, Enji mentioned during our first meetup that you believed we had similar attitudes. Could you explain what you mean? Toshinori asked after a short while of speaking about Haruo's work and All Might's agency. Hmm, I guess that's an unusual thing to say about you two, right? Haruo chuckled lightly, leaning against the low table. Toshinori gave a smile, robbing the back of his neck shyly. Obviously, I don't mean in personality. I meant more in mentality. How you think. Specifically about yourselves. Toshinori tilted his head in confusion, thick brows furrowed. You both think you're not doing enough. It was as if Toshinori had been shot. How could a man he had just met tonight read him so well? I told you, he just knows things. Enji said as he returned with hot drinks and a couple starters for all of them, looking a little amused under his sharp features. Toshinori let out a disbelieving chuckle as Enji set down the platter of green tea. Soy glazed at the mame and gyoza. After many years of learning how to read and understand Enji, you start picking up on similarities in others, you know? Haru said apologetically, as if he had done something wrong. And the self-sacrifice types are so common in pro heroes, it makes sense. The rest of the evening was calm and peaceful as they had the dinner Enji made. Toshinori delightfully complimented the younger man, getting an attitude in response, Enji unable to accept the praise. The two heroes sharing stories about UA, Haru not understanding how they managed to get through that school without dying in the process. Toshinori even spoke of his time in the United States, mentioning David, which highly interested Haruo, who had never gone travelling. It was nice being able to share stories like this. It had been a while since Toshinori could just be casual and have some downtime from being All Might. During that whole evening, Haruo had never once acted like a fan would, instead looking at Toshinori with a sort of fatherly gaze, listening, warm, patient and understanding. Toshinori saw why Enji was so fond of his father. By the time Toshinori left to go home that evening, he felt light and free of worries. The first time in years. Enji and Toshinori's meetings became regular for the two after that, Hado becoming a fast friend to the blonde hero as well. With the time they spent together, the fans were delighted in having the two top heroes be such a close duo. They teamed up regularly enough to make them stand out, usually because All Might was in Endeavor's area, but there were moments where Endeavor would go to wherever All Might was to help out, usually when dealing with several villains in one location that was spread out and would be easier with a second set of hands. Separately, the symbol of peace always topped the rankings on everything, continuously breaking records. Everything except solved cases, where Endeavour was completely dominating. It was ridiculous how much work Endeavour did every single day, how he taught his numerous sidekicks, how he was able to prevent so many attacks and accidents from minor cases to major ones. It definitely humbled Toshinori whenever he looked at Enji's achievements. And thanks to his appearances for with All Might, not only was Enji number two overall, he was even clinging onto number two when it came to approval ratings. Turns out, you don't have to be all smiles and sparkles to have high approval ratings. It's also how you interact with your colleagues and who you're seen with. Even if his sternness and lack of charismatic fan service still intimidated most of the population, they could see that All Might enjoyed the red hair's company, which made a lot of people put away their biases and agreeing Endeavour was just a different type of pro hero from the others. Endeavour was efficient and a good friend of All Might's. That's all the population could see, and that's all they took into consideration. For the most part, things didn't change for Endeavour. When he was alone, he still didn't get approached by most, if any, fans. Some of the braver ones would occasionally pop up to say some words before skedaddling away, but he was never expected to sign anything or take photographs. Not that he complained. If he was ever expected to, the flames around his eyes wouldn't be able to stifle his awkwardness. Which is exactly what happened on a sunny March day, when All Might suddenly appeared in Endeavour's area, wanting some aid with a drug case. As soon as All Might had landed next to Endeavour, they were flooded with fans clamouring for the symbol of peace's attention before either hero could so much as greet each other. But number two was put off by this, but was fine just standing to the side until All Might was done. Endeavour, could you sign this please? Endeavour, can I take a photo? Endeavour! Suddenly, he found himself with an equally large group of fans surrounding him, and whatever PR skills he had attempted to gain since joining UA dissipated into thin air. Overwhelming was the wrong word. He was simply taken aback at the sudden demand for fan attention in this manner, since he never indulged in it. So while Endeavour looked stoic and thoughtful as he stared at the demanding fans, Enji was internally screaming. What made it worse is that he could feel the flames around his face burning up as his awkwardness and lack of socialising over the years caught up to him. He had no idea how to deal with the situation. Endeavour, you've got yourself a nice group there! 
Almost stood up next to him with his bright voice and smile. He wrapped an arm around the firing man's shoulders, giving a thumbs up to the excited fans, who were squealing at the country's favourite duo interacting. Endeavour looked at All Might with an intense side eye, but instead of taking it as anger, Toshinori knew it was Enji silently asking for support in his weakest point. He gave his younger friend a flashy smile and wink, as if saying, watch this. Endeavour and I have some things to deal with, but if you turn up at the Endeavour agency in an hour, there'll be a meet and greet set up. The fans cheered and responded with a choir of okay and thank you. They started dispersing a bit, which gave both All Might and Endeavor a chance to shoot up into the air. All Might thanks his powerful jumping ability and Endeavor to his flames. Why? NG lamented sternly. You can't disappoint your fans. And in an organized meet and greet, it will be easier for you to deal with than being caught randomly on the streets. Toshinori laughed as he bounded from building to building. NG grumbled. You'll have to get used to it eventually. I know, Endeavour growled as they made short work of arriving at his agency. I know. That was said of a sigh, shoulders untensing as he walked into his familiar building. A chorus of, welcome back Endeavour, and hello All Might, from his sidekicks. They were all used to the blonde man being around at this point. Set up a meet and greet panel in the lobby. It has to be ready for in an hour. The flaming sidekicks all looked at each other in utter confusion. Well, they knew what was expected and could absolutely do that, the suddenness of it caught them off guard. Endeavour didn't do meet and greets. You can thank All Might, Endeavour grumbled, All Might giving everyone an apologetic yet still very bright smile. Come on, he said to the other, leading him into his office. Talk business, then we'll talk whatever we're doing in an hour. You really haven't done this before? All Might asked, amused. Obviously not, Endeavour shot back roughly, extinguishing the flames around his face. Now come on, business. They talked business for roughly 15 minutes until they were both on the same page. Already, NG could hear excited chatter outside his agency, and he was dreading it. The drug dealers are up north in Iwate and Hokkaido, while also having groups down in Chugoku. You can leave Iwate and Hokkaido to me. The cold temperatures work best with my health flame, NG said, trying to ignore the noises outside. Drug dealers of illegal quick enhancing quirks were a common problem, something that both All Might and Endeavour were eager to smoke out. Perfect, All Might smiled softly, looking relieved. I really appreciate it, you have no idea how much weight that takes off. I said I'd support you. I am. Endeavour shrugged, as if All Might should expect this by now. I'll head up to Hokkaido in a couple days, then make my way to Iwate. That way, any dealers escaping from Hokkaido will be caught up there. Worst comes to worst, you meet them halfway across the country if they also try to make a run for it from Iwate. I'll update you. All Might couldn't help but laugh at Endeavour's efficiency. When he was talking like this, you'd have no idea NG was incapable of dealing with fans and people in general. Right, with that said... It's been an hour, he declared with a clap of his hands. NG audibly groaned, r rubbing his face like All Might was asking him to carry the planet on his shoulders. Come on, take it as a learning experience from your peer. I'll give you some tips and trips, how about it? That called NG's attention. In that mindset, he could work with that. All Might had learned quickly that Endeavour did best when things were in the name of learning and experience. It's something he appreciated about NG. As long as there was a purpose to something he was doing, even PR stunts, he'd do it perfectly. Fine. Engie sighed. Great! All Might exclaimed, then took a piece of paper and pen from Engie's desk, sitting in front of the man who looked thoroughly confused. Just so I know, what does your signature look like? Engie was stumped and stared at the blank piece of paper like it was threatening his family. You have a pro hero signature, right? Silence. Engie! All Might all but gasped. What? Endeavor snarled back, looking pissed off but actually being embarrassed. You don't have a signature? I have a signature for official contracts! Endeavour defended himself, writing it down. It was a typical, clean, business signature that read NG Todoroki. All Might all but spluttered. Well, what's yours then? This! All Might proudly proclaimed as he wrote All Might in big letters, followed by a doodle of what looked to be his hairdo with his eyes underneath it. It looks ridiculous. Says the number two pro hero without a signature. Ugh, fine. How do I make one? And she grumbled displeased. You want something quick and easy, but you can replicate perfectly every time. All Might explained. Something unique and recognisable to the fans as Endeavour. Unique and recognisable. Hmm. <laughs> he scribbled something quickly on the paper and showed All Might. Surprised at how fast he came up with it, All Might gave him an impressed smile with a big thumbs up. That works! I'll tell you one last thing on the way down, he said of a hand motion to follow him. And she followed without complaint, deciding it was best to let the blonde coach him through this. You don't have to do things my way. That's not your style, nor your brand. You're considered the dark and brooding type, so play into that. What does that even mean? <laughs> Come on, <laughs> Elmite laughed, a little exasperated at the man's cluelessness. Just do what you usually do. 
flames up, normal face, keep the harshness down. If somebody asks you for a photo, you say, sure, and let them do their thing. They want you for how they perceive you, which is this, he explained, motioning to the Hall of Endeavor, who had his arms crossed with a slight frown on. Enji didn't understand how Toshinori could figure out so much about how he should manage things from just being around him. This sort of thing totally eluded him. I'm not made for fan service. He sighed deeply, troubled by what he had to do. Don't worry, because... All Might suddenly dashed forward into a run as they arrived at the lobby, skidding to a stop in front of a long queue of eager fans. I am here! Cheering and clapping echoed through the Endeavor agency, his psychics just as rattled by the noise as Endeavor was. They could tell that their boss was less than eager. Still, he breathed in a little and manifested the flames around his eyes, slowly walking to stand beside All Might, who was posing in his typical dramatics. It was a rather comical scene, one which the fans picked up on immediately in delight. If you all queue here in an orderly line, everybody will get a turn, without crowding the lobby, one of Endeavor's sidekicks instructed, motioning everybody to a certain direction. This felt much more manageable, like All Might had said. NG could handle one at a time. The first group came up, a pair of high school girls, all sparkly-eyed and starstruck. It made Endeavor cringe on the inside, really not the one to enjoy being looked at that way, especially not directly. Thank you so much for the opportunity, one of the girls said, pulling out a special edition Pro Hero catalogue from her bag, opening the cover so they could sign the first page. We were so surprised to hear the Endeavor agency was organising this. It's because this guy's here, as he said. Endeavor replied gruffly, pointing at a tall blonde with his thumb. He looked disgruntled, but it only made All Might laugh, the girls joining in. Not the reaction Enji expected, but he rationalized it was because he was relaxed with All Might by his side to, to help him through this. It was his fault anyway. The girl with the book placed the item on the table the sidekicks had set up. There were a couple pens as well, All Might grabbing one and handing it to Endeavor. Hesitantly and stiffly, he took the pen, staring at the page for a second as if it was going to bite him before just going for it. The two girls watched the movement like hawks. Nobody knew what Endeavor's signature was, since he didn't do fan service. Writing his own name was embarrassing, Endeavor had decided, especially if it was for the sake of fan service. Instead, he leant on the unique and recognizable All Might had mentioned. Endeavor is the opposite of All Might. Where the latter is theatrical, bombastic, and westernized, Endeavor is stoic, fiery, and grounded in his Japanese roots. He pulled the pen back and looked at his signature, a stylized version of the kanji for flame, then at the girls, not sure what to expect. They were vibrating in excitement. That's his signature? The girl with the book exclaimed excitedly. It's so neat! Her friend cooed with just the same energy. Endeavor didn't care for it, but as long as they were satisfied, he tolerated it. All Might also did his own bold signature, then they posed for photos. Well, Endeavor stood like he usually did, arms crossed and stern looking, while All Might did his theatrics. The next half hour or so went like this. All Might did most of the talking, Endeavor only making gruff comments once for every individual. It was clear to the fans coming in that this was All Might's idea first and foremost, and that Endeavor was simply tolerating his peer. While in another context that would have been an uncomfortable vibe, it didn't feel that way because All Might and Endeavor actually got along. While the situation wasn't Endeavor's ideal setting, much preferring being out on patrol and doing actual work, being beside Toshinori wasn't the worst thing in the world. It's crazy to him that only a handful of months ago, he hated the blonde hero. He felt intense guilt due to it. Eventually, it was the last person's turn. It was a young man, about Endeavor's age. He looked friendly, but maybe a little conflicted. I didn't think you'd be the type for fan service, Endeavor. The man admitted with a tense smile, voice clearly showing his disappointment. That confused Endeavor deeply. Wasn't this what the population wanted? I'm not, Endeavor replied honestly, voice harsh. The young man looked at him in confusion. Endeavor side-eyed All Might, who just smiled at him. He wasn't butting into this one. The young man was clearly a fan of Endeavor specifically. He should be the one to deal with it, not the blonde. All Might arrived suddenly. We were surrounded in the streets, so he insisted on this. Oh! The fan's expression brightened. To most other fans, that could have sounded like Endeavor was complaining about the nuisance of adoring fans, but this particular one got what Endeavor meant. It was a compromise so that the heroes could still do their work without their fans missing out. I see. I'm sorry if I came across as ungrateful. Us fans of yours really like your no-nonsense attitude. A lot of heroes seem to only be in it for the glitz and glamour, so we've been worrying you were becoming like that after reaching number two. Endeavor blinked. That was a worry fans had? He never looked at fan forums, so he honestly didn't know what the fan base's perception of him was beyond the news and official rankings. He extinguished the flames ran around his eyes as to properly show his expression to the man. I assure you, that'll never be the case, he said seriously, then a little softer. I appreciate your insights. I didn't know that was a concern. The fans seemed flustered, face turning a little pink. 
Uh, no, of course. He left after getting a selfie of All Might and Endeavor, and that was the last of it. Wasn't so bad, was it? All Might teased as they made their way back to Enji's office. It only worked because you were there, Enji retorted, then became thoughtful. Although, that last guy, that was useful to know. Right? All Might grinned. Endeavor brings something different to the hero world. That's why you're the only one who can rival me in the rankings. Enji didn't respond to that, expression turning a little dark. Rivals. Hardly. Even if Endeavor was the only one biting at All Might's heels, it was still only by just. The gap in power between the two felt like an endless canyon, one he could never cross no matter how hard he worked. Hatred bubbled in his chest again, but he swallowed it down, exhaling through his teeth. No, that wasn't fair. He couldn't hate All Might for that. He was working just as hard as Endeavor, even though his power came so naturally to him while Angie had to struggle every bleeding day to improve. If anything, Angie was angry at himself for not being able to do better. He stopped in his tracks and looked straight into All Might's blue eyes, scowling deeply with a wild ferociousness. The look surprised All Might. I'm not going to rest until I dominate the rankings, he challenged. All Might stared. If he didn't know any better, he'd think it was a threat or a sign of hatred, but having gotten to know Enji a little more over the last few months and getting a slight understanding of how he thought, how similar they were in many aspects when it came to their work ethic, it sounded more like a promise. A promise that neither Endeavor nor Enji were going anywhere, and that they'd always be there to challenge All Might as a rival. Maybe even a friend. He smiled his soft, Toshinori smile. I look forward to it. As he said he would, Endeavor headed up to Hokkaido in the following days, with a promise to bring back a portion of Morioka Raimen from Iwate for his father. And as expected, the drug ring was stopped and arrested up there, with some of the remaining members trying to escape to their hideout in Iwate. Endeavor stopped them there too, and nobody else escaped, as accounted by the police. He informed All Might, who had also easily stopped the drug ring on his side of Japan. I'm going to stay in Iwate for a couple days to help out the police with any of the aftermath and reports, he had told both All Might and Haro in separate calls. However, that didn't go quite as planned, as fans kept crowding the police station, which made it difficult for them to work. Thinking back to the meet and greet All Might had organized, he decided he should do something similar as to not be a bother for the police. It would be a lot more daunting without Toshinori, but Enji felt it was his responsibility. Are there any good meetup locations in the area? He asked the police chief. Local heroes tend to do meet and greets in the park here. The man slid him a brochure about a flower park. Its theme is Iwate's common plants that they look after all year round, such as hydrangeas, Japanese maples, yellow rockets, and autumn bellflowers. A lovely location, very spacious, and gives protection from the weather, since the whole place is covered by a glass dome. Essentially, it's a huge greenhouse. Endeavor called the park to make the correct arrangements, with a promise of payment, of course. I went out to the fans waiting at the police station to inform them of this, as well as got his sidekicks to make a public announcement on the official Endeavor agency social media accounts. When he got there at the agreed time, there was already quite a crowd. Not nearly as big as in his area of All Might, but big enough to get the attention of others in the park who didn't know what was going on. It was daunting at first, but he remembered what All Might said. Flames up, normal face, keep the harshness down. Things went relatively smoothly. The fans were respectful, let everybody have their turn, and give Endeavor some space. Some were intimidated by his face, but most were simply starstruck. NG still didn't like the adoring fan look. But as All Might said, he had to get used to it. It came with the job. After about 20 minutes of this, the crowd had started to go down, with only about 10 or so people still left. He was getting a little worn out at this point, finding this type of interaction tiresome, but knowing it was necessary. Like last time, it was a compromise between his work obligations and entertaining the fans. In the corner of his eye, something white caught his hair, and he turned his head to look. It was a young woman with short white hair, wearing a beige coat and a light blue scarf. She was looking at the autumn bell flowers, which were a deep, rich blue, but that's not what caught his attention. The woman's expression was cold like ice, and had a faraway stare that dulled her grey-brown eyes. But looking at the flowers, there was a softness in her features that intrigued Angie. The smallest of fond smiles graced her face, and a gentle tenderness settled in her eyes. He didn't realise he was staring until the woman perked her head up a little and looked back at him, having felt his gaze. Getting a better look at her face, he saw how beautiful she was with her hair framing her features delicately. It completely disarmed him, the flames around his eyes extinguishing without having control over them. The two stared at each other for merely a couple seconds before the woman moved. For a second, he thought she was leaving, and something in his chest lamented the thought. But instead, she sat down on a nearby bench and continued to watch him. Waiting. Intrigued. Chapter 7. Albedo. 
Rei Himura didn't have much freedom at home. With the Himura clan desperately clinging on to their success and fortunes of the past, it forced Stray to act a certain way for the sake of her family. Being her father's only child, not to mention daughter, only one future was available to her. Be married off to someone in an arranged marriage. Parentally administered courtships used to be the norm in the olden days of Japan, but are now considered old-fashioned and aren't common anymore. With the Himura old-fashioned and elitist by nature, Rei had learnt at a young age and accepted her fate. Her family desperately needed the money that came with an arranged marriage, a traditional transaction, and if that's what Rei could do to support her parents, then she would. This led her to be a very quiet, austere person at home while under the watch of her father. But some days, she just needed to have a day to herself. So under the guise of going on errands, Rei always visited the local flower park near her family's house. Iwate was home to many beautiful plants, but Rei's favourite was the blue autumn bell flower. It made her happy that this park had them all year round so that she didn't have to wait for their natural season to appreciate their beauty. A glass dome protected the plants from the snowy weather, making the park a giant greenhouse, but not nearly as hot. It was such a day as this when Rei entered the park, having enjoyed the fresh March temperatures that came with being in the north of Japan. The cold soothed her heart, a gentle comfort from the bleak expectations of her family. Yet something was different today. As she arrived at the flower bed of the autumn bellflowers, she noticed a small crowd of people, with a very tall, fiery man standing in the middle. Ray didn't pay attention to heroes much. She appreciated their service, and that was the extent of it. But she still knew who Endeavor was. It was hard not to when he was one of the most popular people in Japan, second only to All Might. He was active in the middle of Japan, which made her wonder why he was up north. She didn't give it another thought as she heard the excited chatter of the fans surrounding him, paying more attention to the flowers. One would think the sound of people bothered Ray, but no, she appreciated the addition to the atmosphere. Home was too silent. Ray didn't have any friends, barely interacting with her parents, who had truly little to say besides lamenting their lack of funds. So the chatter of people was also a comfort. A background hum as she looked at the flowers. A smile tugged at her cheeks as she relaxed a little, enjoying the moment. The autumn bell flowers are a rich blue, almost glowing in the natural light of the cold March sun that shone through the glass dome of the park. The feeling of being watched caught her attention, and she shifted her gaze, meeting equally vivid blue eyes framed by flickering fire before it was quickly extinguished, as if Ray looking at the flames had blown an icy breeze to cool them. Brilliant blue met soft grey as Endeavour and Ray stared at each other for what felt like minutes, but was actually barely a couple seconds. Something about the way the red-haired man looked at her intrigued Ray. His features were sharp and young, a seriousness in his face that was smoothened out as she returned the gaze, the sternness replaced by subtle surprise. Ray didn't know why, but she wanted to talk to this man. Without thinking about it, she sat down on the bench beside the flower bed, still looking at the man who blinked in surprise at her actions before quickly returning to the fans clamouring for his attention. They were none the wiser about what just happened. She waited and observed. There was an awkwardness in his movements as fans asked him to sign various items and to pose for photos, yet it was unnoticeable under the air of professionalism he held. His stature demanded respect, and even without the flames around his eyes, he was intimidating. Yet he lacked the scare factor that Ray might have expected from a man like Endeavour. Barely ten minutes passed, and the last of the fans said their goodbyes and thanks to the number two hero, who stiffly waved them off. After a moment, he fully turned to look at Ray and hesitantly approached her. Endeavour absolutely towered over Ray. Even if she was standing, she'd barely reach her shoulders. Hello, he said, almost sheepishly, with a stubbornness to speak to her. Amenji to Doroki. Not Endeavour, Ray thought to herself. I'm aware. She replied coldly, expression never changing from her icy look. The man may be the number two hero, but he was a stranger to her. She didn't know his intentions or what he was like. The frigid response seemed to disarm him a little, as his eyes widened ever so slightly from relaxed and mildly surprised. In truth, despite being a pro hero for almost three years now, Angie still wasn't completely used to people casually knowing who he was, especially when he had never met them before. He knew he didn't have to introduce himself, but that was a proper way of greeting strangers which is why the woman's icy reply shook him a little. Not just because of her tone, but also her flat, dead-eye look as she looked up at him. Why were you staring, Angie Todoroki? The woman asked. Angie stared down at her, brain short-circuiting as he thought of something to say. Ray stared up at him, never once blinking as she peered straight into his soul, awaiting an answer. He didn't blink either. There was no reason. She had just intrigued him. She didn't break the silence. There was a question he had to answer first. Angie looked to the left with only his eyes, starting to feel nervous sweat pricking at his neck. Ray kept on staring, eyes completely disarming the tall man. Flames flickered from his cheekbones as Angie sheepishly avoided her look, now looking to the right as he began to feel embarrassed under the weight of her stare. 
The woman's expression finally changed as she lifted her eyebrows. The small flames adorning his cheeks. Was he blushing? I saw you looking at the flowers, he said finally, crossing his arms as if that would give him the strength to talk. Ray looked at the autumn bell flowers as he mentioned them, but quickly shifted her gaze back to him. Do you... Mm. NG still wouldn't meet her gaze, staring at the floor as if the dirt was of particular interest. Like those flowers? Why did he ask that? NG yelled at himself on the inside, for his expression didn't show it besides the embarrassment that was already there. He desperately wanted to wave away the flames on his burning cheeks, unable to extinguish them at will like he usually could, but there was no strength in his arm to dampen them out. His brain was fried and a humiliating heat creeped up his collarbones to his neck, something he had never experienced before. Was he just that socially awkward, or was it because he was speaking to a woman? No, he had spoken to them before, but this was different somehow. More personal. It put him on the spot like never before. He both wanted to go home and stay here forever. Ray stared wide-eyed as the Goliath of a man that was the number two pro-hero endeavor all but crumbled in front of her, acting like the muted version of a skittish cat. He's so awkward. A laugh caught in her throat, and she had to stifle it, biting on the inside of her cheek gently as to not embarrass him further. Seeing a man built like Endeavor acting so flustered, it was unthinkable. It didn't fit his image at all. That's so cute, she thought, absolutely endeared. Yes, I think they're beautiful, she said with a soft chuckle, talking about the flowers. And she replied with a firm, hmm, as if he had nothing to say, because he had absolutely no idea what to say. I'm Rei Himura, she finally introduced herself standing up to be more polite. As she thought, she barely reached his shoulders. It's nice to make your equator, said Oroki. Likewise, he said tensely, clearly trying to control his voice. What brings you up to Iwate? Ray said mercifully, giving the poor man a topic he'd have more to say about. Angie cleared his voice, finally meeting her eyes again. I... I was dealing with a case, he replied, finally finding the strength to pat away the flames that wouldn't go away on his cheeks. Ray once again had to stifle a laugh, seeing the fire quirk user unable to control those tiny flames. It started in Hokkaido, but some runaways tried to find refuge in Iwate. They've been caught, so I'm helping the police with the aftermath and reports. Do you often do meet and greets when dealing with reports? She asked with a slightly raised eyebrow that could have been taken as teasing. It completely disarmed Angie. I... no. I don't usually do meet and greets. I only did this because they were crowding the police station, and I didn't want to be a further bother. He tried to explain, wanting to rip his gaze away from Ray's, but somehow unable to. The previous deadness in those brown-grey eyes was replaced with a sweet softness, and he couldn't look away. I see. I suppose that means you'll be very busy for the next couple days, then, the white-haired woman said softly. Ray was traditional in her own way. It was her upbringing, after all, to be ladylike, unseen and unheard. But in this moment, all that was pushed to the side. I'm free now, Angie said, a little too hurriedly, and he quickly bit his tongue. If... if you have some time, we could... What did people their age do? I saw a cafe here, if you'd like. Ray knew the cafe well, liked to spend time there when she had some minutes to spare. Staying out too long wouldn't be a good idea, would make her parents start questioning her, but right now that wasn't her priority. I would like that, she said with a sweet smile, but won't you stand out in your suit? The idea of being interrupted by a fan felt a little embarrassing. He would, which is why Angie had brought his long brown coat with him. It laid on a different bench on the other side of the flower bed, which he glanced at to make sure it was still there. Ray followed his look and understood. There was only so much NG could do about standing out. He was over six foot tall and had fiery red hair after all, but after dampening out the rest of his flames that ran through his suit and putting on the coat, he blended in a lot more. Ray and NG silently walked beside each other as they made their way to the cafe, both of them trying to get used to the other's company. This was Ray's first outing of a man as much as it was NG's first outing of a woman. Neither knew how to act. Once they got to the cafe, they ordered their drinks. And he got a green tea, preferring it to coffee, which he found rattled his nerves too much unless he had it first thing in the morning. Rattled nerves were not what he needed right now. Ray, on the other hand, asked for a Japanese-style iced coffee, which surprised Enji a little. It was March in northern Japan. Enji paid while Ray found a seat, picking a table in the corner of the cafe that she often sat at. There was a window there that overlooked the park, and you could see all sorts of beautiful flowers. It was peaceful. Enji soon joined her with both their drinks and watched her take a sip of her iced drink. Are you not affected by the cold? He asked, curious. No, quite the opposite. I enjoy the cold, Ray said with a smile, looking at the view outside. My quirk gives me a resistance to extreme cold temperatures. I find it soothing. She turned her head to look at Engie and found him listening to her. Interested. She took another sip of her drink, not wanting to stare too long at the man. 
Angie subconsciously copied her movement, drinking his tea. They stayed in silence for a bit, not sure to talk about now that they had some privacy. As much privacy as the curious barista would give them, anyway. Do you come to the park often? Angie asked carefully. His small talk was as pitiful as his PR skills, but he thought of the things he talked about with his father and Toshinori. Interests, patterns, everyday life things. Anything he could pick up on that could be a point of conversation, starting with the obvious. As often as I can. It's peaceful here. Ray started, but her voice drifted off, leaving a lot unsaid. She had just met this man. She didn't think it was appropriate to talk about her home situation. But Engie caught on it immediately, and he scoured his brain for an appropriate answer. I used to go to parks a lot when I was younger, he finally said, thinking back to the days he'd spend during the wintry months in middle school training at the park with his father. With my father, mostly. Ray's eyes lit up a little. Your father? She asked, curious, crossing her arms on the table to show she wanted to hear more. What's he like? The best person I know, Angie said without thinking, then thought about it and let out a sigh of a chuckle. And I know all might. Ray understood the implication and laughed softly as well. That's quite the feat, she commented. It was clear to her that Angie was fond of his father. Do you have any other family? No, it's only my father and me. My mother was never in the picture, for me at least, Angie admitted, not realising the weight of what he said. He was the second most well-known person in Japan, yet never once had he received any messages or calls from an estranged woman claiming to be his mother. She either didn't care or didn't know. Maybe she wasn't even around anymore. Angie would never know unless she reached out, as neither him nor Haro had any idea where she had disappeared off to, 20 years ago. Oh, I'm so sorry, Ray said softly, thinking she had hit a sore spot. Angie looked at her with slightly raised eyebrows. There's no need to be sorry, he said matter-of-factly, which took a second for Ray to process. Since she wasn't interested in heroes, she's never seen one of the rare interviews of Endeavour, therefore didn't know his mannerisms nor his blunt way of speaking. Not a bad thing, she just wasn't used to it. What about your family? Ray's expression soured ever so slightly. My parents have their way of doing things, she said vaguely, rolling her drink in her hands as to make the coffee and ice cubes swirl slightly. I don't dislike them. They do what they have to. I guess I'm rather... distant to them. Engie blinked, seeing that there was some tension on the subject, but not understanding it fully. If you'd rather not speak about it, we can change topic, he offered, remembering how his father redirected conversations when things got tense at times. Haro never forced Engie to speak about certain things if he couldn't deal with it at the moment, but always encouraged him to try. Please. Ray nodded. She didn't want to spoil the mood of her home life. Instead, they spoke of their interests. Favourite flowers were quickly a topic. Ray mentioned the autumn bell flowers from before. Engie not having an answer, but agreeing the blue flowers were beautiful. Favourite foods was something Engie could actually answer, naming kuzumochi. That made Ray laugh a little, saying that's not what she had expected. She mentioned ice cream as a food she enjoyed, keeping with the cold theme. Both Ray and Engie like sashimi, but Ray doesn't like grilled fish. Engie mentioned his father didn't like fish in general. Ray replying, we have so much in common already, which made Engie laugh a little. Ray loves the sea. Engie likes the beach during his summer heat. Ray finds enjoyment in soap operas. Engie likes watching old movies with his father. Ray doesn't manage hot weathers well, while Engie finds rain annoying since it makes using his quirk more difficult. Neither of them had siblings. What are your aspirations for the future, Engie? Ray asked, finishing the last of a drink. She quickly dropped calling him to Doroki. Engie thought about her question for a while. Beyond hero work, I haven't thought about it. Angie admitted. He was highly successful at an incredibly young age, and the only thing on his mind was keeping at it. There's always more to be done, always villains pottering about causing problems. Hero work was endless, he had no time to think about anything else. An old conversation from his first year at UA with his father suddenly popped into his mind, and his thoughts stuttered. He hadn't thought about marriage since he was 16 years old, during that one conversation on Sekoto Peak, but now here the thought was, loud and bright. His cheeks started burning, but he ignored the sensation as he took another drink of his tea. Mm, I guess marriage is always a potential aspiration, he muttered into his mug, Ray barely catching the words, but very easily noticing his embarrassment. Yourself? Marriage is unavoidable for me, one way or another, she said softly, maybe even a little sadly. And she gave a confused look. My family is poor. They want to arrange a marriage for me and they get the payment from it. He raised his eyebrows at that. That's very old-fashioned. Ray nodded at the comment. Do you not get a say in who you marry? I do, of course. But for my family's sake, I'll accept whoever my father approves of. Something sudden and bitter caught in Engie's throat, and he covered his mouth with his hand. It looked thoughtful, but truly, he was trying to keep down an ugly sentiment. It wasn't directed at Ray, nor even at her family, 
but had himself. For a split second, he had thought, I'll pay her family. Enji felt incredible guilt at simply thinking it. He didn't understand we had thought that in the first place. Who would you approve of? He asked after a moment, the woman opposite him blinking at the question. What do you want? The question stumped Ray. She hadn't thought of that before. Maybe when she was younger, but what she wanted had never been asked of her. As before when Enji couldn't answer the question of why he was staring at Ray, Ray couldn't answer his question. He simply waited for an answer. Patient. I would like to be a mother, she admitted softly, looking down at her finished drink. I love children. It's very quiet of my parents. I'd love to nurture a happy, lively home. So I'd approve of someone who would like that as well. She looked up. Enji was smiling. He was listening. Ray liked to smile. She wasn't used to being listened to. Ray, the table. Enji said softly, interrupting her thoughts. Ray looked down, realizing she had started to ice up the table, frost spreading from her hands to cover both her cup and the tabletop with delicate swirling patterns of ice crystals. It was Ray's turn to be flustered as she apologized hurriedly, brushing off the ice with a slightly blushing face. They left the cafe soon after that, as Ray needed to get home, and she walked back with her. Once they made it to her home, a large estate where Ray knew her father realistically could barely afford keeping, Ray turned to Engie and bowed in thanks for the drinks. Engie, flustered, sheepishly bowed in turn, thanking her for her company. He dug into his coat pocket, taking out a business card he used when making connections with other heroes. With both hands, he handed it to Ray, who politely accepted it. If you ever need anything, Engie said softly, a small flame flickering at his cheek without him noticing, please don't hesitate to call me, I mean my agency. The flames on both his cheekbones intensified as he caught himself, flustered once more. Ray watched this with an endeared smile. Of course. A delighted grin spread across her face. She called him the next day, around the same time as when they had met at the park, when she knew he'd have some time. Chapter 8. Gleam. The second Engie came home, Harrow knew. A wide grin split his face. Engie's face turned a deep red, flames flickering beyond his control in his cheeks. Toshinari blinked confusedly as he sat politely at the low coffee table. He had arrived a little earlier than Enji, wanting to discuss the report of the drug case that they had just solved, but now he was watching his friend catch on fire with an expression he had never seen before. What? Enji said sharply at his father, trying to avoid the man's knowing look as he grinned mischievously. Who is she? Haro asked, teasing. Enji stuck out his lower lip in a stubborn pout, turning away to leave for the kitchen. Hey, no, no running away! His father laughed as Engie stalked off down the hall, shoulders hunched and patting out the fire on his cheeks. Is he okay? Toshiniri asked, scratching his head. I've never seen him look like that. Me neither, Harold but cackled, clearly amused by this unexpected development. All he'd expected from Iwate was a portion of Morioka Raiman, but now Iwate had returned him his son smitten. I think he met someone in Iwate. Met someone? Toshinari couldn't be more confused and lost. You're just as bad as him, you know that? Huh? Harrow didn't understand how the top two heroes in Japan were both so emotionally dense in their own rights. Enji returned, having put the Morioka Raiman he'd gotten for his father in the fridge, face no longer red but still pouting. So, do I at least get to know her name? Harrow asked, hands on hips. Enji's face scrunched up in embarrassment, shoulders hunching. Ray. That's a beautiful name. She likes autumn bellflowers. And you know something she likes? Did you socialize? Hera asked of a squint. Enji rubbed the back of his neck. Who are you and what did you do to my son? Enji let out an exasperated sigh through his nose, going to sit down at a low table, clearly embarrassed. I'm just teasing, Enji. Hera laughed, ruffling up his son's hair as he stood beside him. You can tell me more about her when you're comfortable. For now, I'll make you two some tea while you work. Enji mumbled a thanks as his father left. Enji looked at Toshinori, who had a flat expression on his face. He could see the cogs turning. It clicked. Oh! The blonde exclaimed, face red in his own embarrassment, as he realized what was going on. I'm so sorry. Enji glared. Sorry because you only just caught up, or sorry because you didn't think I was able to meet a woman? I plead the fifth. This is Japan, you bastard. Enji did eventually go into more detail about Rei Taharo, a week after he had returned from Iwata. He asked Rei first if she was alright with that, to which she enthusiastically gave permission. Upon seeing a photo of Ray, Enji had shakenly taken on their second meeting before he had left for home, Harrow smiled widely. She looks lovely. In the photo, Ray was smiling brightly, eating ice cream out of a cup. Ice cream in March, though. Inuate. 
She has a nice quirk, gives her resistance to extreme cold, NG explained. It's her favourite food. You really have fallen for her, haven't you? Haro laughed, to which NG sheepishly looked away. Hey, no, that's okay. That's a good thing. I'm glad you found someone. I only met her a week ago. And you two have been texting every day since. Don't think I didn't notice. NG grumbled at his father's eagle eyes. He had tried to be so very careful about messaging Ray, had tried to keep his phone at home as to not get distracted while doing hero work, but he soon found himself checking his phone whenever he had a free moment, a little too eager to read Ray's replies and thoughts. Even his sidekicks had started to give him questioning glances from how much she was staring intensely at his phone, thinking something was wrong. Endeavour always dismissed their questions. He sighed, putting his phone away and lying back down on the bench to continue his bench press set. Enji was in his home gym, working out with Haruo. That's still a way they bonded together. Does her family know about you? His father asked, unnecessarily spotting for Enji as his son bench pressed an ungodly amount of weights. She'd rather they didn't know for now. They're old fashioned, Enji explained, not elaborating until he was done with that particular set and sat up again. They wanted to have an arranged marriage for the money. Hara's expression twisted into a frown. They want to sell her off? Pretty much. That's worse than just old fashioned. Harrow said harshly, not liking the sound of Ray's parents. Ray said it's a Himura thing. Apparently, they're elitist and all about keeping the bloodline pure, which resulted in marriages between distant relatives. With that and the uprising of quirks, it made the clan dwindle and lose success. They started selling their children into marriage after that, Ray being part of that generation, NG explained, wiping the sweat from his brow of a towel. Which means, in theory, if you wanted to marry Ray, you'd have to pay her parents. Harrow thought out loud, ignoring the embarrassed look NG shot him. They're not invited to the wedding. Dad. I'm serious. Even so, I've barely known Ray a week. We're not... How do you say it? NG looked at Harrow, not knowing what to describe his situation. You're not official. Harrow helped out, giving NG a reassuring smile. But you are interested in making it so, right? Isn't this going too fast? NG asked after a short moment of silence, insecure. These feelings were new and he didn't know how to deal with them. Only if Ray is not on the same page. Communication is important, Harris said as he took about half the weights off of the bar, which we both know is something you find difficult. NG didn't say anything to that, wordlessly standing up as he switched places with Haro on the bench, necessarily spotting his father. You mentioned before, your marriage was based on circumstances and brash decisions. Enji said finally after a while, his father giving him a raised eyebrow at the comment as he concentrated on not getting crushed while bench pressing. After that conversation on Sakota Peak years ago, they hadn't spoken about Hara's marriage nor Enji's mother. You tell me if I was making any brash decisions, if you think I'm doing something wrong. Hara immediately put the bar back in place and sat up, looking directly at Enji. For as long as I'm around, I'll always be here to help and guide you, yes, Haro said very seriously and genuinely. Why? Are you worried? Angie made a small sighing sound that came from the back of his throat, conflicted. Haro patted the free space on the bench beside him. Angie sat down. What's worrying you? Is it Ray? Angie shook his head. When Ray told me her situation with her family, with the payments... He said hesitantly, an uncomfortable, sickly feeling aching at the back of his throat. The words weren't coming out. Didn't know how to express what he had thought. Harrow waited, giving him the time to find the words without rushing him. I thought... I'll pay her family, he finally admitted, rubbing a hand over his mouth with a pained expression in his eyes. His chest hurt like he'd just admitted to a crime, and he felt like he had committed one. Harrow observed his son and his conflicted demeanour. And it bothers you that you thought that? Hara asked, trying to get to the root of the conflict. Enji nodded. Why? Enji shrugged, not knowing, and not removing his hand from his mouth. Hara pulled at his wrist, encouraging him to lower it. Use your words, Enji. I... I don't know. That familiar phrase again. I just... I thought it, and I immediately felt guilty. I don't even know why I thought it. There's only one reason to why you'd want to pay an arranged marriage, Enji, Harrow said with a light chuckle, Enji shooting him a distressed look, not appreciating Harrow laughing. Sorry, you get what I'm saying though, right? She told you that's the only way she'd be able to get married, and you wanted to fulfill that requirement. It's pretty clear that you want to marry her. I just met her, that's not fair. Not fair on who? Ray. 
there it is. Haru gave him a soft smile, and Enji only looked more distressed and confused. You felt you weren't being fair to Ray. Oh. Enji looked down at the floor, leaning on his thighs as he thought at what Haro said, feeling like an idiot for not realising it himself. He felt he had been unfair to and disrespected Ray, because even if she agreed to the arrangement, it would still only be for the sake of her family, like she had said. Not necessarily just because she wanted to. Enji sighed, running a hand through his hair. I'm awful, he breathed out. You're dense is what you are. Haro laughed, pinching his grown son's cheek, making the taller man groan in annoyance. Enji, it's fine to admit you have feelings for Rei. Love affects everybody differently. The universe just hit you hard and fast in the face with it, because it knew you wouldn't notice otherwise. Enji dragged his hand over his face, making a full body exasperated sigh. I get why you feel guilty about thinking that. Maybe you should admit that to Rei. Absolutely not, Enji snapped, not lifting his head. I'd rather die. Don't even joke about that, Haru snapped back sternly, ghost sentiments of being crushed by a building and unable to breathe creeping up his chest and throat. Sorry, Enji apologized, looking at his father. Haru watched the solemn expression on his son's face and gave him a small reassuring smile. I really think you should talk to Ray about that, especially if you intend on continuing to talk to her. Ray's parents will find out eventually if they haven't already, and it'll become a topic whether either of you like or not he said as he laid a hand on Enji's shoulder, trying to make him come to terms with the reality of it all. Enji sighed. He knew Haro was right. That same evening, as he finished his routine before going to bed, he looked at his phone, eyes reading over his text messages with Ray, harmless, enjoyable discussions. About their days, how the weather was, Ray sending photos of various flowers she saw this week. Enji liked the white anemones the most. Enji sending her a photo of his father while the man was doing some class planning. Ray said he looked very kind. Ray asking about Enji's agency. She was baffled to hear just how busy and successful it was. And Enji asking about Ray's plans in the upcoming weeks. He intended on asking her if she wanted to go cherry blossom viewing in Osaka with his father and him. Maybe Toshinori too if he could force him to take a break for a day. Ray said she had no plans and he hadn't replied to her message yet. He took a deep breath in and sent her a are you free to call text. He waited. She replied almost instantly. Yes, he called her. Truthfully, he was disastrous on the phone. Not only were his texts dry, he didn't understand all the various emotes and who knows what else there was, but on top of that, he found speaking on the phone hard. It wasn't the same as being face to face with someone, something he found difficult as is. Good evening, Angie. Ray's voice said as she picked up. Her tone was light and gentle. Good evening, Ray, he replied tensely, feeling dread start to bubble in his throat. Sorry it's sudden. I... I just want to confess something from our first meeting that I'm not proud of. Oh? Ray's voice sounded subtly intrigued by his blunt honesty. What is it? His words got stuck in his throat. Speaking to Haro was easier, not only because Haro knew how to speak to him best, but because there was no threat of Haro leaving. Ray was a completely different story. And the idea that she wouldn't want to talk to him anymore because of this honestly scared him. Even if they, did be- even if they didn't become something more, the thought of losing a friend in Ray upset him more than he had initially realised. It was a strange cocktail of emotions he wasn't used to, and it made talking impossible as they broiled in his chest. Engie. Ray's soft voice snapped him out of his thoughts. Take your time, I'm listening. He swallowed and took a deep, shaky breath. When you spoke about your family wanting to set up an arranged marriage for the money, I thought of paying, he admitted, a sickly feeling washing over him as he said the words. No longer because of his own guilt, he had come to terms with that after his conversation with Harrow, but because of how Ray would react. She didn't for a while. NG expected her to disconnect. If she did, and never wanted to speak to him ever again, he'd respect that. You want to marry me? A choked sound caught at the back of his throat in pure shock. He could hear his heartbeat in his ears, hands becoming clammy. He swallowed again, face starting to heat up. His voice reacted before his brain did. Only if you want to. His voice was meek, so unlike him, feeling he couldn't speak of how his own throat was all but choking him. Ray stayed silent. Why did you want to know my plans? The question sent him for a loop. Plans? Oh, I I wanted to offer you to come see the cherry blossoms in Osaka. With me, and my father, and maybe another friend, 
he said tensely, eyes wide and staring straight in front of him, which happened to be an uninteresting wall. More silence. I can travel down this weekend. Weekend. She'd be staying two days. There's plenty of spare rooms at my house. I can pay for your journey. His voice sounded too hurried and frantic to NG. It made him cringe. He wanted to stop, but he couldn't, his brain having switched off a while ago. Ray didn't sound as put off by his voice as NG did. I look forward to it. Good night, NG. She ended the call. He didn't move, staring at the wall. She looked forward to it. Did she just miss the entire problem he had? Had he not communicated well enough? No, he'd been blunt. He had stated what he did wrong, but he wasn't proud of it, so why... Dad? He called out, needing support. Yeah? Harrow's voice could be heard in the distance, where he was watching the news. Ray is visiting this weekend. There's a pause before hurried footsteps approached, Harrow all but skidding as he turned the corner. He looked at NG with the same wide-eyed surprise. You told her? Yes. And she wants a visit. I invited her to see the cherry blossoms of us in Toshinori in Osaka. She said she looks forward to it. The two men stared at each other, both as clueless as the other as to what to do now. Neither of them had thought this far ahead. Enji didn't even think he could get this far. Reality suddenly hit Enji, and his face became bright red to accompany the flames bursting at his cheeks. Enji didn't sleep that night. Neither did Ray. She stared up at the ceiling while laying on her futon, cheeks pink as her heart pounded, phone pressed against her chest. Ray had heard Enji loud and clear. She understood why he may have felt bad about thinking of paying for the arranged marriage, but all she had heard is that he wanted to marry her. Only if you want to, he had said. Only if she wanted to. Only if she chose him. Only if she chose him too. It was her choice. She could choose what she wanted. A bright, happy smile tugged at her cheeks, feeling like her heart would explode. Ray wanted to see the cherry blossoms of Engie. Chapter 9. Radiant. It was no surprise that Ray's parents were on her case. Her mother, being more like Ray, was much more silent and only gave her questioning glances whenever she saw Ray smiling fondly at her phone, or when Ray started packing a suitcase. Her father, on the other hand, continuously demanded an explanation for the change in her behaviour these last two weeks. Ray had been tight-lipped about it, much to her father's dismay. She would eventually tell them, but as things were, she didn't want them interfering. This was between her and Engie, and she wanted to keep it that way for now. This was hers. I'll be back Sunday, she said with that explanation to her parents one Friday morning at the entrance of her house to catch a train. The plan was to meet at Engie's town, travel to Osaka on Saturday to spend the day there, then for Ray to travel back on Sunday afternoon. Ray, this is unacceptable. Where are you going? And who are you seeing? Her father demanded sternly, disliking the lack of control he had over the situation. He wasn't a violent man, but what he says goes, and Ray had never done anything like this before. It's not how she was supposed to act. A friend invited me to go see the cherry blossoms. My trip is being paid for. She explained politely, wrapping her blue scarf around her shoulders before picking up a small suitcase. Her father looked like he was going to argue again, but his wife gently held his arm, which made him stop. The older couple looked at each other for a moment, Ray's father relenting once her mother smiled softly at him. We trust you to be sensible, Ray, her mother finally said. Ray had a duty in this family, a strict harsh one that even her own mother had abided by. However, in the last couple of weeks, the older woman had seen a change in her daughter. Ray smiled more. Her eyes had a giddy light in them she hadn't seen since Ray was a child. Whatever was going on, Ray's mother didn't want to snuff it out. While she expected Ray to fulfill her role as a Himura, she didn't want to deny her daughter this newfound joy. Ray gave a small polite bow and left. She would have left whether her parents let her or not, but having her mother silently convince her father and give her permission lifted a weight from Ray's heart she hadn't realised was there. It made things that little bit easier. Travelling down to Musutafu took a few hours, meaning she arrived around midday. Enji had said he and his father would meet her at the station. The closer she got to her destination, the more nervous she became. They had only texted since the phone call a couple of days ago, and she hadn't seen him since he left Iwate two weeks earlier. She didn't know what to say or how to act. This wasn't something she had done or dealt with before. Ray had expected to be set up with someone and for everything to be planned out for her, but with this, it was all up to her and Engie to figure things out. A comfort she had was that both of them were painfully awkward and inexperienced at this, so they could learn together, at their own pace. As the train pulled up to her destination, Ray took in a breath to calm her nerves and stepped onto the platform. 
Even before she reached the exit of the station, she saw Enji towering over everybody else. Besides him was an older man with dark burgundy hair, over a hand resting on Enji's upper arm as he spoke to him with a reassuring smile. Enji's father, Ray recognised. Soon, both men noticed her, and Enji awkwardly raised his hand in a wave, as if his red hair and height wasn't enough of a beacon for Ray to see him. She smiled, and did, her previous nervousness almost forgotten as she passed through the train station gates. She went to stand in front of Enji, and the two stared at each other for a moment, not knowing what to say. Haro desperately tried to control laughter. Hello. Hello, Enji. I hope you had an easy travel. It all went smoothly. Thank you for paying for it. Of course. This is my father, Haro Todoroki. Haro was all but shaking from holding in his laughter, biting the inside of his cheek. These two were so shy of each other, it was adorable to him. It's lovely to meet you, Miss Himura. He said politely with a bow, Ray returning it. Enji talks a lot about you. Dad... Enji hissed out, embarrassed. Only good things, I promise. Haro smiled brightly, knowing exactly what he's doing. Ray smiled back, already liking the older man. The drive to the Todoroki household consisted mainly of Ray and Haro getting to know each other, chatting in the back seat while Enji sat in the passenger seat, his chauffeur Kuramada side-eyeing his boss as if he had grown horns. Upon arriving, Enji showed Ray her room, before all three of them settled in the living room. Ray and Haro talking about going to Osaka tomorrow. You like flowers, right? Haro asked after taking a sip of his tea. Very much. I often go to the flower park where Enji and I met, Ray said with a bright smile, no longer nervous and completely relaxed. Something about Haro was calming and grounding, made her feel like there wasn't a single worry in the world that could bother her. How did you two meet? Enji never got into the details of that, the older Todoroki asked curiously, leaning onto the table. Enji's ears started burning from embarrassment and he quickly moved to stand. I'll get a start on lunch, was all he said before he left the room for the kitchen. Once alone, he exhaled and rubbed his hands over his face. He was grateful for Haro being here, otherwise his nerves wouldn't be able to take it. Despite Ray seemingly having a good time so far and being in good spirits, the open-ended nature of their last phone call had left him anxious. He'd felt anxious before, but that had been a new way of training, nothing to do with personal relations and feelings. He was so bad at this, it boggled his mind. Distracting himself with preparing lunch, he got a start on the soba noodles. It was pretty cold outside, but the house was warm, so he had settled on making the cold type, assuming Ray would prefer those to the hot ones. Also in the menu was vegetable tempura, as well as the fitting tip dipping sauce and a variety of condiments to have with the soba and a cabbage salad. That should be enough. If not, he can always... Talk. Enji all but jumped out of his skin at the sound, quickly looking at the source of it. Ray had opened the sliding door to the kitchen, peeking in curiously. She didn't notice that she had given Enji a fright, or if she did, she didn't comment on it. Is everything alright? Enji thought maybe more tea was needed. Yes, everything's perfect. Ray reassured with a smile, walking into the kitchen as to watch what Enji was making. I just wanted to see what you were doing. She looked at the ingredients that were in various states of being used, before looking at Enji. His button-up shirt had the sleeves rolled up to his elbows as he chopped the green onions, making him look very domestic. Ray liked that. I'm making cold soba noodles, he said, silently hoping that was okay with her, but unable to verbalize it. I love cold soba noodles. Ray smiled widely. Anything I can help with? She'd been taught since a young age to cook, and despite the bleakness of her future, cooking was something Ray genuinely enjoyed. It was just fun, and the motions of chopping vegetables, measuring out ingredients, seeing the process of separate items becoming a completed meal was cathartic. You're a guest. And she replied as he pushed the chopped green onions into a small ceramic bowl, setting it to the side. Ray wasn't used to be the one catered for. She didn't know what to do with herself. Enji noticed the stiffness in her pose and started to feel bad for the harshness of his tone. Not that he could help it. He looked around the kitchen for something he could give Ray to do without putting burden on his guest. Could you make the dipping sauce? He asked after a moment, voice as soft as he could physically make it, which wasn't much. The ingredients were already laid out and if Ray looked out of the sauce, he could concentrate on the noodles and cabbage. Of course. Ray had made it many times before. She knew what to do. As they got busy with their tasks, they fell into a comfortable silence, only the sounds of cooking filling it in. Once Enji was portioning out the free platters evenly, Ray spoke. Do you not have hero work to do? Ray asked, knowing just how hardworking and dedicated to his duties Endeavor was. She had done her research after meeting him, and it came to understand just how capable and efficient the number two was. His solved cases were nothing to sniff at. I took Friday to Sunday off, he replied, picking up two of the food platters, Ray taking the third. I didn't want to be busy while you visited. He admitted hesitantly, a mutter that Ray barely caught. At that, her cheeks went a little pink. For Endeavour to take time off for her, that's not something she was going to downplay. Thank you. She said meekly as the two joined Harrow in the dining room. 
Seeing his son and Ray enter the room with slightly reddened cheeks, Haro once again stifled the laugh. The rest of the Friday was filled with Ray exploring the Todoroki household with Haro and Enji, planning out the schedule for tomorrow, getting to know the two men better and helping Enji with dinner as well. It was a few words and polite goodnights that everybody went to bed, having an early start in the morning. They left for Osaka at the crack of dawn and arrived mid-morning. Already, there were quite a few people around with the same intent of viewing the cherry blossoms, so the trio made their way to the meeting spot Enji and Toshinori had agreed to. He'd managed to bribe him into joining with the promise of meeting Rei, something the number one hero was all too eager and excited about. Due to the sensitive nature of All Might's true identity, both Haro and Enji wanted to let the blonde introduce himself in whatever way he thought best, so they had only vaguely mentioned to their guests that they would meet a friend in Osaka. Rei hadn't asked further details, trusting the two Todoroki men. Enji saw Toshinori before the rest of them. Despite his ridiculous height, the blonde was slouching and acting so meek nobody even glanced at him. He also wore a dark blue beanie with red and gold rims. His own merch, Enji noted, wanting to roll his eyes. Ah, good morning, Enji, Haruo, Toshinori said as soon as he saw them, smiling brightly in his Toshinori way. He then saw Rei, the shortest among all of them. You must be Miss Rei Himura. It's lovely to meet you. I'm Toshinori Yagi, he said sweetly, bowing to greet her. The woman doing the same. She squinted a little at him. Had she seen him before? He looked oddly familiar, but she couldn't figure out why or how. A pleasure to meet you. Please call me Rei, she returned politely. Between Hara and Toshinori, she could see Enji was in good hands. They smoothed out his harsh and stoic demeanour as he was clearly comfortable with the both of them. We should get going before it's too busy, Enji said, leading the pack to the cherry blossoms. Having done a thorough research on what was expected, he had bought everything they needed to have a picnic, including drinks, food, and something to sit on. Haro tried to convince him he was going overboard, but Enji was hearing none of it. It was a beautiful day, over the chilliness of spring was still very much present. There was quite a lot of people, but not enough to be overbearing, the loudest in the area being overexcited tourists. There was a gentle breeze that carried the cherry blossoms throughout the area, even though they hadn't reached the trees yet. Various food smells lingered, and the sound of children playing as the group got closer to their destination became louder. Seeing the first few families that had settled under the cherry trees, kids playing various games, either running around or sitting, Ray smiled, delighted at the sight. Enji noticed this, and observed her looking around, wondering what she was thinking. Toshinara and Haro made it a point to not stare at them both. They found a relatively isolated area, mainly so that nobody would come looking for Endeavor's attention, although thankfully everybody was too busy with the blossoms and their family to pay attention to their surroundings and who was about. Toshinara is plain looking enough that nobody even blinked at a too tall man. Enji first was setting out the food and drinks, a variety of juices, canned drinks, some easy to munch on snacks. He planned on buying proper fresh food and treats later on, knowing that the area was sold various things like hanami dango, cherry blossom themed cookies, milk pudding and sushi, so he'd make a trip for those when the others commented on being hungry. For now, Toshinara and Haro cracked open some of the canned coffee drinks, Ray helping herself to a juice bottle, while Enji tried to do the most difficult of tasks. Relax. He just wanted Ray to have a good time. Have you gone cherry blossom viewing before, Toshinori? Ray asked the blonde after a sip of her juice, politely sitting between them and Enji. The height difference was comical, and Haro all but choked on his coffee. A few times when I was quite young, Toshinori nodded. I haven't been since, so this is nice. Great idea, Enji. He tried to drag his friend into the conversation, noticing him to start shut in on himself as he overthought everything. Hmm? Oh. Hmm. Enji hummed in reply, blinking twice as he came back to reality. I don't think I've ever been, he said, looking at Haro, who shook his head. Not properly, no, his father confirmed. I did take you to the park when you were really small, but we never properly stopped to view the blossoms. After that, I just didn't have the time. It was around the time Enji started kindergarten that Haro had become lost in work and bills, forgetting that time was passing and that his son was going, missing out on normal family outings. While the accident was horrific and still left Bahara and Enji with emotional and mental scars neither were ready to face even now, it had been what made him realise his shortcomings as a parent. Being a single father must have been hard, Ray said softly, Haro giving her an equally soft smile. It would have been harder if I didn't have a son like Enji has been taking care of me for far too long. He laughed lightly, nudging his red-haired son with his drink can. Enji shot him a disapproving look. That's what I'm meant to do, he retorted, not for a second wanting Haro to think himself a burden on Enji. The latter had never thought of his father as one, so there was no reason for the older man to think it. Haro let out a sigh of a chuckle, amused that both him and Enji had the same mentality when it came to each other. Both thought they didn't do enough for the other while thinking the world of each other. Rei and Toshinori noticed this too, and smiled, knowing just how fond the father-son duo were of each other. 
This continued for half an hour, making small talk, enjoying snacks, with breaks of silence to look at the delicate pink petals swaying in the wind and sun. Toshinari understood why Enji liked Rei so much. She was sweet, with a fondness for the world around her, and an interest in what others had to say. The looks her and Enji gave each other didn't go unnoticed. Shy little glances, endeared smiles. It was so obvious to both Haro and Toshinari that the two were completely smitten. Soon the drinks and snacks diminished in quantity, and Enji offered to go get everybody something more filling to eat. As long as it's not fish, I'm happy with anything, Haro said, smiling at his son who was getting up. The latter gave a nod, then looked at Toshinari. Anything is fine with me, thank you, the blonde grinned, then looked at Rei. I'll go with Enji, she said getting up as well to follow the tall man. I don't know what the options are, I'd like to see what's available. With a stiff nod, a very silent NG led the way to the food area he had previously looked up, Ray walking by his side. After a short moment of silence once the two had left, Toshinori and Haru looked at each other and started laughing. Do you think they'll ever confess to each other? Is that even possible? Toshinori said as he wiped a tear from his eyes at laughing too hard. Haru tried to catch his breath, running a hand through his burgundy hair. I have no idea, he chuckled. Something's going to have to give eventually. Ray and Angie didn't say anything for a while as they walked under the blossoms. Ray loving the view. Thank you for inviting me, she finally said. Angie looking at her with his usual expression. I'm grateful. Embarrassed, Angie looked away. I'm glad you came, he said softly, cheeks starting to burn. Despite what I said about our first meeting. <laughs> that really bothered you, didn't it? Ray said with a slight giggle, bringing a hand up to her lips. I understand why, but please don't let it. I took no offense. The tall man let out a disgruntled sigh, so clearly bothered. Did you mean what you said? About what? That if I wanted to, you'd marry me. Ray, well, just as shy as Engie in many ways, was much more able to bring up the important topics that needed to be faced, especially once given the freedom and space to speak. Unlike Enji, whose entire man just stuttered to the point he stopped walking. Yes, he admitted, not looking at her. Something touched his hand, which made it twitch, but didn't pull away. He looked down. Ray had reached out for his left hand, holding it with both of her own to make him look at her, wanting his full attention. While his hands were broad and rough from years of training and fighting, hers were delicate and soft. Why do you want to marry me? The thoughts weren't forming. The words weren't coming. He couldn't say it. He didn't know what it was. This wasn't what he had trained his entire life for, he wasn't built for whatever this was. His jaw tensed as his eyes focused on an answer, looking at the two hands holding his own. The last time somebody held his hand, he must have been a small child holding his father's. This was very different. It wasn't the enveloping warmth of fatherly affection, rather a gentle comfort of unspoken tenderness. Three words entered his mind and he got scared. Are... He swallowed, not daring to meet it, raise awaiting eyes. Are you sure you're okay with this? With me, wasn't said. He didn't need to. Yes, Ray replied. She understood, could feel the conflict between mind and heart as Engie stubbornly stared at their hands instead of at her. This isn't going too fast? Not for us. Engie's eyes fluttered as he finally made eye contact with Ray. There was so much warmth in her eyes, so unlike the first time they met, but it nearly knocked him out. No flames flickered around his eyes, but his cheeks did redden. Why do you want to marry me? Ray asked again, softly, taking a step towards him. She was small next to him, but in this moment, Engie felt like Ray could destroy his entire existence with but a word. I love you. It was barely an exhale, a whisper in the wind that was for Ray and only Ray to hear. She smiled. I love you too. She closed the distance and leaned into Engie's chest, letting go of his hand as she blotted herself against him. Instinctively, yet carefully, as if scared of his own strength, Engie wrapped his arms around her and stayed still. His heart beat a hundred miles a second as he stared wide-eyed at nothing, his mind catching up to reality. Finally, he untensed, shoulders and arms relaxing as Ray easily fit in them, bringing a hand to cradle her head against his chest, hiding her away from the world. Surrounded by pink petals fluttering around them, icy cold and blazing inferno balanced into a cosy warmth. Haro and Toshinori sat and waited. You think they forgot about us? Toshinori said after a while, staring up at the blossoms as he sat at the foot of a tree, leaning against it. Possibly. <laughs> Haro yawned, stretching. Is falling in love in the horizons at all for you? No, Toshinori admitted without hesitance. Being the simple of peace, I can't put someone in that situation. There was a lot about Toshinori that nobody knew about. One for all, his master, his purpose. He could count on one hand those who knew. He didn't dare speak to Haru and Enji about it, as if opening the truth up to them would also place a target on their backs. Even though he knew Endeavor could look after himself and his family better than anyone else, it was still a fear of Toshinori's. Fair enough? Haru didn't push it. He had the privilege of knowing All Might's true form and being his friend. He only hoped that if Toshinori ever wanted to open up about his deeper troubles, he knew that Haro would always listen. And you? Would you ever be in a relationship again? The blonde asked the older man, who shook his head. No, 
Well, I say that, who knows what the future holds, but I don't intend to. I'm still married on paper, anyway, he replied, much to the same tone as Toshinori. I'm not much good as a husband. I'm barely ever good enough father to Enji. I don't believe that. Neither does Enji, the younger blonde retorted. You're the only one who thinks so little about yourself. Haro laughed. Takes one to no one, right? He said knowingly, side-eyeing Toshinori from where he was laying on the floor. The blonde finally looked down from where he had been staring at the pink petals and gave the man a sheepish smile. You're like Enji, number one pro hero, saving countless lives, and you still can't give yourself a break. It's great that you're humble, but you're allowed to give yourself a pat on the back once in a while. All punishment and no reward isn't good for the soul. This is reward plenty, Toshinori said softly, eyes closing as he smiled, leaning against the tree. Haro smiled but looked away, noticing two familiar figures in the distance. They're holding hands, he said suddenly, sitting up like he'd been stung. Toshinero suddenly wide-eyed and aware. As Haro said, Ray and Enji are walking back towards them, her right hand in his left, holding a bag of various themed foods in the unoccupied ones. At seeing his father and friend's giddy expressions at this development, Enji's cheeks lit up in flames. He had to quickly shake his head to extinguish them. Ray was all smiles and sparkles. Congratulations! Toshinori chimed. Shut up, Enji growled, avoiding their looks. Don't be embarrassed, Haro chided with a laugh, standing up to meet the two. He looked at Ray, smiling softly. I'm really happy. Me too, she admitted cheerfully. The rest of the Saturday was spent in Osaka, Toshinara and Haro celebrating the two lovebirds. Enji thought he was going to overheat with how embarrassed he was, but Ray's happy mood distracted him from his own feelings. He was more than content with seeing her smiling so freely. They left Osaka late in the night, having had dinner there and saying their goodbyes to Toshinori, who promised to visit Enji soon in Musutafu. Eventually, we can tell Rei, the blonde had said in a private moment of Enji, referring to him being All Might. If Rei was going to be around a lot more, and most likely permanently, it would be wise to not hide this secret from her. But for now, I'm just your layman friend who you met at a bar. Enji agreed. Once they had arrived at the Todoroki house, they all went to bed in their separate rooms, Rei having the best sleep she'd ever experienced while well, Enji barely slept at all. He didn't want her to leave. Ray didn't want to leave either. Are you going to tell your parents? Enji asked during breakfast. Ray having already packed a suitcase which was waiting by the front door. Hara wasn't up yet. Ray hummed and thought that she ate a mouthful of beef. Not straight away, she concluded. Maybe in a couple months. I don't want them to interfere for now. I'd like it to be just us two. Enji nodded in agreement. And you sure? I'm sure we're not going too fast. Ray snapped at her chopsticks at him before he could finish his sentence, making him stick out his lower lip into a pout. Are you worried for me, or are you having second thoughts? No, I mean, Angie said hurriedly, catching himself. I just want to be sure this is what you want. What she wants, Ray thought happily. This is what I want, she smiled. Angie smiled back. It was with much difficulty and many promises to call a meet-up soon that Ray left for Iwata in that early afternoon. She wasn't even gone, and she already missed him. If Enji had any less control over himself, he'd be crying, Haro stated. Enji argued that he wouldn't. Neither Haro nor Ray believed him. As soon as she was home, Ray was bombarded with questions from her father, to which she gave vague, polite answers. Who was she with? Friends. Where did she meet them? At the flower park. Where did she go? Cherry Blossom viewing in Osaka. Why hadn't she said anything before? She didn't think it was important. Only when Ray's mother told her father to give Ray a chance to rest after her train journey did he stop. Ray retreated into her room. Her father's overbearing attitude didn't dampen her good mood as she texted Enji that she had arrived safely. His, I'm glad, made her smile. Chapter 10. Glint. If Endeavor sidekicks had noticed a change in his behaviour before, now they were sure somebody had replaced their boss altogether. Endeavor was a professional, focused man. It was completely out of character for him to be distracted in the middle of a fight against the villain. Endeavor had gotten punched in the face. That simply wasn't something that happened. Are you alright, sir? One of his sidekicks asked as Endeavor tended to his bruising cheek at the agency. It would heal in no time thanks to the on-site medics he had, but it was still humiliating to have been injured at all. Everything's fine, he said curtly. A lot is on my mind. Ray was on his mind. It had been a couple weeks since the cherry blossom viewing trip in Osaka, and he desperately missed the white-haired woman. She was on his mind constantly. They still messaged every day, had phone calls every couple of days, and were already planning another date within the next few weeks. Ray had been the one to call it a date, and Enji had almost crushed his phone in shock at the word. In a good way. While Enji still did excellent, consistent and solid work, unrivaled in his number two spot, but didn't stop those who worked closest to him to notice the subtle changes in his behaviour. Nobody other than All Might and Haro knew the actual reason, something the two men mischievously teased Enji with. 
Every mention of Ray had him turn a bright red to match his hair, which amused his father and friends to no ends. Enji having said I love you to Ray kept replaying in his mind. They're not words he ever thought himself able to say. Not ever. In general, unspoken affection was integrated in Japanese culture, something Enji much more aligned himself with. But Ray had completely disarmed him and had managed to make him actually vocalise how he felt. This moment also replayed continuously in Ray's mind. Every time she thought about it, it made her giddy. Not only that she was able to freely say it, but that she had been able to hear Enji, the stoic, awkward man that he was, say something as vulnerable as sweet as I love you, made her blush like a rose. Her parents more than once handed her on it, but she never said anything. The 20th of March came around, Haro's 39th birthday. It was celebrated at home after the school day was over, something both he and Enji preferred, with Toshinori also present. While Rei couldn't be there, she did send Haro a photo of the first blue nemophilas that had started blooming at the park. It wasn't until mid-April that Enji and Rei were able to see each other again. They had found a cosy rhythm between messages and phone calls, Enji continuously apologetic for being so busy with hero work, but Rei shut him down quickly, understanding that he had an important duty to fulfil as number two and All Might's friend. She saw the two heroes team up regularly now that she actually paid attention to the ongoings of the hero world, and after seeing just how much All Might actually did, as well as the recordings of the Hero Rankings event where Endeavour had promised to support him, Rei was understanding of the two's dynamic. Although, she couldn't help but form a theory in her mind that Toshinori was somehow connected to All Might. The similarities were striking, and while she only met Toshinori once, she had theorised a symbol of peace and him must be related in some ways. Brothers, maybe. She didn't dare probe the topic, however, knowing it could be a sensitive one, and simply hoped they would tell her the truth when the time came. Finally, Enji found time to spend the day in Iwata, one bright day in April, and travelled up. Ray had suggested they do a Hachimantai mountaintop trail course, since sightseeing season there was just opening up, so it would still be fairly empty while being prime time to visit. Unknowingly to Enji, Ray had asked Haro behind his back about activities Enji might enjoy. Haro had suggested something to do with working out, so Ray combined her love of nature with that. Plus, she had never done the trail course before. They met at the station and while still blushing and shy, were much more comfortable with each other. Since Ray wasn't as fit as Enji, they had settled on one of the short trail courses, just over an hour. It wasn't too tiring, the weather was light and fresh, perfect for them both, and the views were beautiful. Iwate, being one of the largest prefectures in Japan with the lowest population, had a mass of untouched nature, which made for gorgeous scenery. Similarly to that time in Sekoto Peak when Enji learned to appreciate her surroundings instead of being obsessed with training, Enji gained a newfound enjoyment for trekking during this time with Rei. Rei deeply enjoyed being in nature and peacefully walking at her own leisure, feeling relaxed besides Enji. Seeing him take in the sights made her happy, loving being able to see him discover a new side to himself. He smiled much more openly, resembling his father as he listened to Rei talk freely about the various native facts she knew about her home prefecture. Ray delighted in being able to talk about her interests this extensively. By the time they had finished this trek, Ray needed a rest from using her voice so much, not having realised she had been the one to do most of the talking while Enji listened. While once upon a time she might have been apologetic and embarrassed about having over-talked, she could see that Enji had been more than happy and interested in what she had to say, taking it all in and even asking questions that she eagerly answered. They settled at the first Yakiniku restaurant, where Ray suggested he try Maesawa beef, a coveted Wagyu brand that was demanded all throughout Japan, which originated from Iwata. He did, and as Rei rested her voice during lunch, Enji was the one to awkwardly make conversation, speaking mainly about his hero work. Rei understood that Enji found his work life much more easy to handle than normal everyday interactions, but so while the hero world was foreign to her, she listened attentively to Enji. This was his life's work, everything he had trained for, and she wanted to learn to appreciate it. The amount of work he did on the daily still boggled her mind. She didn't understand how his agency received and responded to 100 requests a day on average. It wasn't a real number to her. After lunch, that day continued with more walking around the Hachimantai area, window shopping a little, and she taking note of Ray being fond of softer colours and simple, subtle accessories, before both returning to the station. Neither Enji nor Ray had realised they were holding hands the whole afternoon until they had to say goodbye, which was with many blushes and promises to meet again soon neither of them notice a camera clicking away either. Only a couple weeks into May did Endeavour have to face the allegations of him having a girlfriend during a surprise street interview. He had been finishing a job with All Might, some case of small-time thieves being a nuisance in a shopping area but the top two heroes had been able to smoke out and put an end to. In the middle of handing the culprits over to the police, Endeavour was suddenly bombarded by overly excited paparazzi, something that never happened to him. All Might was just as taken aback as he was, not used to being ignored by the press. Endeavour, are the rumours true? What do you have to say about the photos? 
And Dover blinked confusedly. Over the, the expression on his face was as stern as usual. What are you talking about? He asks harshly, annoyed at having been disturbed while working. The arrested thieves in his hold dazzled by the paparazzi as the number two hero tried to hand them over to the police. This! One of the reporters said, showing him the front cover of some hero gossip magazine he had no care for. It showed a photo of him and Ray from their date at Hachimantai, holding hands and talking. Elvis Ray's face was hidden by his form due to the angle of the camera, but them holding hands could clearly be seen. Is this your girlfriend? He froze. All Might gaped. The police gaped. The thieves gaped. Endeavour's face and shoulders burst into wild flames, burning hot and bright to the point the paparazzi had to take a few steps back unless they wanted to get fried. Ow, ow, hot, hot, hot! The cold villains complained as Endeavour's body temperature went up. All Might came to the rescue, sliding with a dramatic laugh between Endeavour and the reporters, bringing all attention away from the flame hero to him. Endeavour, I'm done with my lot of villains! He said loudly, giving his number two a chance to return to his duties before he set the surrounding town on fire. Wordlessly, still a walking bonfire, Endeavour walked to the police and handed the slightly roasted thieves to them. All Might, did you know about this? The reporters asked excitedly, showing the magazine cover. With a bright smile and thumbs up, All Might loudly proclaimed, I know nothing about anything! Which did absolutely nothing but confuse everyone. Endeavour groaned long and loudly with his head in his hands once they returned to his agency, his PR team and top sidekicks around him. His flames were wild, but had retreated to only his shoulders, though his face was a vivid bright red. It's not so bad, his PR director reassured. The paparazzi are just nosy, this will do nothing to your rankings. If anything, your approval ratings might boost past All Might because of this. People love a romance story. Hey, All Might said at the notion of his number one approval ratings being threatened. I don't want to be the gossip piece of the month, Endeavour snapped fiercely. This was humiliating and intrusive. He was going to burn every gossip magazine agency to the ground. He caught his anger and exhaled heavily, filling the room with steam. Still angry, but more controlled, he rubbed his temples with a deep frown. Is the woman's face visible? Not in any of the photos published, since the angle was too awkward to get a clear shot since you're in the way. At least that. Deciding there was nothing more that could be done about this and tolerate the attention, meaning Endeavour would be working overtime and ignoring every non-work-related approach from the public, everybody but All Might left Endeavour's office. You're worried, All Might pointed out the obvious once it was just the two of them. The flame hero sighed heavily as he extinguished all his fire, slumping in his seat as if defeated. What if Ray becomes a target, he said, glad his blonde friend was observant enough to notice when Engie was distressing on the inside without being able to express it. You think a villain would use her against you? The blonde tried to understand. Isn't that the reason why you keep everyone at arm's length? All Might had nothing to say to that, knowing that Endeavour had noticed his deliberate distancing of himself from everybody else that wasn't Engie and Harrow, and putting her in danger. All Might understood the fear too well, had felt it many times. This hasn't happened before with your father? He asked, just now realising that the reporters never questioned Endeavour about his family, nor even hearing Harrow talk about being hounded by the press. Endeavour shook his head. Well, I guess you just walking with someone versus holding a woman's hand is different. That's probably what got the cameraman intrigued in the first place. We didn't even realise we were holding hands, Engie admitted, which made All Might snicker. Don't you laugh at me. The snickering didn't stop. Engie had later told Ray about the photo as well in a phone call. While he had thought that she'd be worried about her being in the public eye like Engie was, Ray sounded quite unbothered by it. In her mind, her face wasn't shown, so her identity was safe for now. The magazine did mention that the woman holding hands with Endeavour had white hair, but that was a vague description. You're the number two hero. You're a point of interest. It's going to be public eventually, Ray had said like it was no problem. I'm not worried. But what if somebody targets you? Then I'll have my pro hero boyfriend to save me. Ray giggled, Engie blushing at being called her boyfriend. It sounded ridiculous. Childish even. Something young'uns did, as All Might would say in his Americanisms. You are a young'un. Harrow scorned jokingly as he flipped through his students' files, Angie having expressed him his thoughts. Don't think you're a know-it-all adult just because you're number two. Same goes for you, Toshinari. The burgundy-haired man looked at the blonde who was doing some reports on his laptop. The actor looked sheepishly at the older man from his spot next to Angie in the Todoroki living room. Why are you doing reports? Don't you have an entire agency to do that for you? Angie asked, seeing how that's exactly what he did himself. Endeavour did all the physical, heavy lifting work, while his sidekicks focus on the paperwork, gave him the freedom to do more work. There's only so much they can do since I'm all over the place. I need to file things properly, the blonde lamented a little. Don't tell me to get a sidekick. He snapped as Engie opened his mouth, as it was something the redhead often nagged him about. Fine. Don't complain when I become number one because you couldn't file fast enough. 
Engie huffed, sticking his lower lip out. He gained an amused eye roll from the symbol of peace. The rumours, annoyingly, didn't go away, and now all the flaming psychics gave their boss knowing looks whenever he looked at his phone. It was embarrassing, and Endeavour had none too gently yelled at his psychics to get back to work more times than he was willing to admit. June arrived, and Ray was the one to travel to Engie this time. The redhead had been paranoid about the paparazzi again, but Ray couldn't have cared less. She wanted to see Engie, and that's all that mattered to her. I wish we could see each other more. She sighed into his chest when she finally got to hug him after arriving at the station. He was tall and strong, and his warmth was a soft comfort. Ray didn't like heat, but Engie's was the sole exception. Mm hmm. Engie had his eyes closed as he hugged her back, the world around them not existing for a moment. We will, eventually. Saying once we get married was still too embarrassing, but Ray smiled against him, knowing exactly what he meant. Public displays of affection was not the norm, especially not to someone like Engie, where holding hands was enough to turn his face red. But in these moments, societal expectations were thrown out of the window. This time round, Engie had been in charge of the date, and he had settled on a visit to the public aquarium. Ray liked the sea, so he hoped this would fall under something she'd enjoy too. He didn't quite understand that it didn't matter to Ray what they did, she just wanted to spend time with him. But she appreciated his silent efforts to find something she'd like specifically. And she did enjoy the aquarium. The environment was darker than other locations, which meant fewer prying eyes that would stare at the number two hero in civilian clothing. Not to mention, it was a weekday with less people in general, something NG had been quite insistent on, for race sake. The dark bluish ambience was peaceful, with only the various sea creatures swimming around behind the giant floor-to-ceiling glass to keep them company. Ray and NG took their time, discussing and reading the various descriptions around the aquarium, taking interest in each of the fish, crustaceans, and various species they couldn't pronounce without stuttering. Once again, Engie was reminded of just how much Ray loved nature and found interest in everything, which in turn made him want to learn and find out more of the world. It gave them something to talk about without both being awkward, blushing messes. As the day went on, they stopped for a short lunch in the cafe before continuing to go around the building. Ray made a sudden stop when they came across koi fish, which weren't in a traditional pond as usual, but on display in the same oversized tanks as the rest of the aquarium. Looking at her, Engie saw an amused smile on her face as she pointed to some red and white patterned ones. I bet our children will look like that. Like fish? Ray laughed at Engie's blurted out comment, whose brain had stuttered the second she had mentioned children. No, because of our hair colours, she said after recollecting herself. Engie's cheeks reddened a little at having embarrassed himself as Ray reached out to hold his hand. I hope our children get your blue eyes, she said softly, looking up at said eyes she loved so much, beautifully complemented by the water's aqua reflection rippling on the walls. Engie blinked, his cheeks only getting redder, and while he wanted to look away, he stubbornly returned Ray's loving gaze. No matter how much they complimented each other, neither could take it without deepening a few shades of pink. Having... he stopped, thinking his words through, not sure what he wanted to express or how. Ray had made it clear in their first meeting that children were something she wanted, desiring a family unlike the one she currently had. Children with me. You want that? Obviously. Ray laughed reassuringly, leaning her head against his upper arm as she looked back to the various coloured koi. I wouldn't be with you if I didn't. That was true, but Angie couldn't help the nagging feeling that he wasn't enough for Ray, but she deserved so much more than what he could ever offer. Ray was gentle, sweet, and kind. Interested in everything and everyone around her, wanted to build a happy, lively, and warm home for herself and Angie, wanted to support her in his hero work, Loved Haro and Toshinori from the short time she had with them, was slowly learning how to read Enji and understand his mannerisms, was patient with him, and the more she opened up and smiled, the more her sense of humour and teasing nature shone through. She had so much to give and didn't ask for anything in return. He didn't understand why she'd so willingly settle for him. Your thoughts aloud, Enji Todoroki, Ray said in a hushed tone, feeling the intense gaze on her as she watched the red and white fish. With the water light reflecting on her pale skin, she looked like porcelain. Soft brown eyes met his again, and his thoughts mellowed down to gentle hums of just how much he loved Ray. Facing her fully, he brushed a loose hair strand out of her face. Before he could pull his hand away, Ray laid her own over his, and leant her cheek into his touch. Nervousness started creeping up Engie's nape, but his body moved before his brain could start overthinking again. Leaning down, he carefully shortened the gap between them. Ray tilted her head upward and lifted her heels up to meet him halfway best she could. It was a shy, soft kiss that only lasted a moment before the two pulled back. They said at each other before Ray giggled, a blush forming on her cheeks as she leaned up to give the equally blushing man another peck on the lips. A chuckle escaped his throat as he wrapped his arms around her, bringing her into his chest. They watched the koi swimming around in swirling motions, a lovely mix of red and white patterns. 
My Father's Warmth is currently ongoing. As of this episode, there are currently 40 chapters and I'm nowhere near done. I will be posting audiobooks uh, every 10 chapters. So the next one will be chapters 11 to chapter 20. And then when I am when I am done with recording all the chapters and the story is done, I will put it all together in a big compilation. Thank you everybody for watching and thank you to my channel members. <laughs> all the su I can't I can't do an all my voice. I don't I don't know how to do an all my voice. <laughs> oh, help. I don't want to do this. I'm not bombastic. I can't do this. <laughs> you know, I was under the impression you hated That's just rude. Go away. You're loud. Okay, anyway. Um. <laughs> my pronunciation is so bad. <laughs>